Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to his warning about the economy in August 1986 that, and I quote, we are now in a crisis which is as great as the crisis of war. I ask the Prime Minister, given that foreign debt has significantly worsened and that we are in the worst recession for 60 years, why haven't you shown the same leadership in the economic war that has ravaged almost, almost, almost all Australians as you did in making our commitment to the Gulf War? Yeah. Yeah. The the Prime Minister. Well, Mr uh, Speaker, it's very interesting that uh, the Leader of the Opposition goes back to uh, 1986 because I understand that uh, there has been a good deal of uh, uh, retracking to 1986 uh, relating to a comment by my colleague the Treasurer back uh, in that period. And uh, it seems appropriate, therefore, Mr Speaker, to satisfy the Leader of the Opposition that I should, uh, in fact, indicate to the Leader of the Opposition at some length, because presumably he regards it as a serious question, just what leadership has been provided in that period and the achievements that have been made for this country in that period. And it only came uh, from uh, the leadership that this government provided. Now, let me, first of all, uh, Mr Speaker, look at the macroeconomic change in that period since 1986. Uh, in the year to the June quarter uh, 1986, the underlying inflation rate was 9.8 per cent. In the year to the December quarter 1990, it was 5.4 per cent. Uh, a remarkable uh, reduction, Mr Speaker, by any standards. Looking at employment, since May 1986, almost three quarters of a million new jobs have been created, with employment growing at an average annual rate of 2 per cent. And that, in that period, is some three times uh, the rate of employment growth that you were able to achieve in the government that you were advising. <laughs> the question of manufactured exports, Mr Speaker. The volume of manufactured exports in 1989-90 uh, was 90 per cent up on the period from 1985-86. That was an average annual real rate of growth of 17.5 per cent over the period. If we look in the area of tax, there has been a whole raft of tax reforms in that period, Mr Speaker, uh, in, uh, including reductions in personal and corporate tax. Let's uh, look at the question of the top rate of personal tax. In 1985-86, it was 60 per cent, the level that you walked out of office with. That's the best you could do, 60 per cent. Order. It is the, currently 47 per cent. The refer to the opposition rather than you, lest people think he's referring to me. <laughs> Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I can assure you I would never find you guilty of what they were guilty of, Mr Speaker. Now, Mr Speaker, let me uh, say that uh, when they, the opposition, uh, were in government, they walked out of office with a top uh, personal rate of 60 per cent. We reduced that to 47 per cent. The corporate tax rate in 85-86 uh, was 46 per cent. It's now 39 per cent. In 1985-86, the gold mining industry enjoyed a quite unjustified exemption from corporate tax. That situation was remedied with effect from the 1st of January this year. Looking at the budget deficit, uh, Mr Speaker, they don't like being reminded of the budget deficit that we inherited, but I'll tell you what it was. It was $9.6 billion. In 1985-86, Mr Speaker, Order. Mr Speaker, the budget deficit Order. Will you ask, you, you ask, you ask your friend, uh, the ex-Senator Stone, what was in prospect? He'll tell you. 9.6 billion dollars. Now, in 1985-86, uh, Mr. Speaker, Order. the budget deficit, the budget deficit was almost five and three quarter billion dollars. In 1989-1989-90, uh, we'd achieved a surplus of just over eight billion dollars. A turnaround in that period from 85-86 of just on $14 billion. If you look at investment, Mr Speaker, business fixed investment as a share of real non-farm GDP was 11.2 per cent in 85-86. It peaked at a record 13.7 per cent in 88-89 and remained well above average at 13.2 per cent in 89-90. And if you look very importantly, Mr Speaker, at something that those opposite should hang their sh head in shames about, if you look at the area of superannuation, Mr Speaker, we're changing the face of superannuation in this country, turning, 
turning something which was a privilege for the few into a right for all workers, working both through the Accord and through the sort of reforms to the tax system we announced in May 1988. Now, those are the changes, the great changes, the enduring changes for the benefit of this country in the area of macroeconomic reform. If you look at the area of microeconomic uh, reform, Mr Speaker, let me just take up a little bit of the House's time in referring to the massive changes since then. We have continuously, continually, continuously in that period since 1986 pushed back the constraints on what is achievable. Mr Speaker, I suggest that if in 1986 you had been told that a government in this country, any government, could have gone as far as we have in reforming the microeconomy, you would have been met, met with utter disbelief. For example, in the area of tariff cuts, Mr Speaker, an area where you never did anything. You were there in office year after year after year, and you kept an economy insular, protected by these high tariff walls. Now, Mr Speaker, what we've done is uh, virtually knock those walls down, and they've been virtually eradicated by the decisions we've taken in just five years. The average effective rates of assistance were 22 per cent in 83. Today, they're 12 per cent. By the end of the decade, 5 per cent. Nominal rates, of course, Mr Speaker, are similarly falling from 13 per cent on average to 3 per cent. In other areas of microeconomic reform, Mr Speaker, look at what's been done in this period. Deregulation of domestic aviation, deregulation of foreign investment, the Royal Commission on Grain Handling and the great reforms that have been acknowledged that have come from that. Telecommunications reform, first in 1988, to remove some of the more obvious impediments in that area to competition in secondary markets, and then more recently for direct competition. Award restructuring, Mr Speaker, and productivity bargaining to add flexibility to a wage system, while in the outcome retaining an achievable national aggregate uh, result. Deregulation of oil marketing. Major reforms of the defence industries, removing a large drain on the taxpayers' resources. Reduction of crew sizes, Mr Speaker. Reduction of crew sizes in the area of maritime industry, bringing down the uh, manning levels in Australia to the OECD averages by 1992. And a program of waterfront reform, Mr Speaker. Firstly, to reduce manning levels in the industry. Secondly, to lift productivity. Thirdly, to remove industry levies. And thirdly, uh, fourthly, Mr Speaker, to create a genuine system of company-based employment and the competitive dynamic which that will produce. Now, Mr Speaker, let me add that while all those things have been done in this period under the leadership of this government in the era of macro reform and micro reform, this government has also been about building a more just society. Now, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, now, Mr. Order. Mr. Speaker, let, Mr. Speaker, let me prove my point. The fundamental building blocks that this government has provided for creating a more just Australian society are firstly, firstly Medicare, secondly, taxation reform, including the capital gains tax and uh, the fringe benefits tax, and thirdly, Mr. Speaker, increasing increasing real benefits for those in society most in need. There have been further improvements, Mr Speaker, in social justice since 1986, despite the constraints that have been placed upon this country by the external adjustment task. Mr Speaker, without doubt, the most important of these achievements has been the Family Allowance Supplement, which was introduced in December 1987. And, uh, Mr Speaker, that was uh, introduced to assist low-income families. In 1990, uh, 1991, Mr Speaker, we provided over half a billion dollars for family allowance supplement, $587 million to be precise. Combined with family allowance, Mr Speaker, we now provide the equivalent of $50 net income per week to low-income families with two children. In addition, Mr Speaker, rent assistance was extended to low-income families in December 1987. Commonwealth-funded childcare places, Mr Speaker, have increased by more than 80 per cent to 155,600 places. Since 1986, Mr Speaker, there have been further increases in social welfare benefits and pensions in real terms, bringing the pension, bringing the pension up, bringing the pension up to over 25 per cent. Order. Mr Speaker, bringing the pension up to over 25 per cent of average weekly earnings. And that reform process is continuing. The Minister assisting me on social justice is overseeing an important agenda reform, 
including, Mr Speaker, ameliorating locational disadvantage through addressing problems of access to employment, education and services faced by people living in particular areas, such as the outer fringes of our major cities and rural and remote areas. Now, Mr Speaker, of course, the coalition, to the contrary, are not at all interested in social justice. What they are about is re-entrenching privilege in this country. And they would do that, Mr Speaker, by abandoning, by abandoning the fundamental building blocks of Medicare and capital gains tax and by an attack on the social welfare system. Mr Speaker, when you look at all those areas of macroeconomic reform, microeconomic reform, social justice, you have a total refutation of this absurd allegation that leadership has not been provided by myself and the Treasurer and this government since 1986. As a result of all that's been done, Mr Speaker, this economy is going to be a stronger economy and the foundations of social justice Order. in this country have been advanced. The Honourable Member for the Northern Territory. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Community Services and Health. Is the Minister aware of media reports last week about the poor diet of many schoolchildren? What is the government doing to educate schoolchildren about improving their diet? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Speaker, um, I thank uh, the Honourable Member for Northern Territory uh, for his question, uh, one that goes to the issue of uh, nutrition and diet, but of course it's one that uh, is extraordinarily important uh, to all Australians. The question of nutrition and uh, diet and uh, the lack of the poor nutrition that uh, a number of Australians suffer from is a major cause uh, of many, many illnesses. And of course, uh, particularly for Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory, uh, the situation uh, faced by so many people uh, reflects, uh, in fact, these problems of nutrition and diet. The reports uh, that the Honourable Member referred to uh, were uh, following the launch of a booklet called The Nutritional Value of Australian Foods. That uh, booklet uh, was launched uh, at Darabin Parkland's uh, uh, secondary college uh, in my electorate. The department uh, assisted the food science class at Darabin College to conduct a snapshot briskets breakfast survey of 100 students the day before the launch. And that showed that 14 boys and 17 girls consumed no food or drink before school on that day. Of the children that had eaten breakfast, 10 per cent of the boys and 16.5 per cent of the girls had eaten only one thing, for example, fruit tubes, cheap cheese twisties, a wagon wheel, Coca-Cola, cough lollies or che chewing gum. The media around the country, Mr Speaker, conducted their own snapshot surveys, which backed up both this finding and the more authoritative results from the National Dietary Survey of School Children, aged 10 to 15 years, which found that 8.5 per cent of boys and nearly 10 per cent, 9.8 per cent of girls, did not consume anything before 9am on a school day. In a total number of respondents, uh, Mr Speaker, of over 5,000, uh, a very significant, uh, uh, very significant number. These uh, figures, Mr Speaker, are shocking figures in many respects. They indicate an underlying problem which results uh, in uh, very, very substantial health risks and ultimately uh, poor health for many, many Australians. It's one of the reasons why the government, uh, as part of its Better Health program, has given uh, the strongest uh, emphasis to the whole area of nutrition. It's one of the reasons why uh, the uh, ABC program Everybody, which uh, many members would have seen, has been uh, supported by the government and has very rapidly achieved uh, one of the highest ranking uh, programs within the ABC as it seeks to deal with the issue of poor nutrition uh, in Australia. Mr Speaker, uh, obviously a great deal needs to be done in the area of nutrition. I can't think, and I'm sure uh, my colleague, the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, would agree with me, that there is no more significant uh, problem to be faced if we're going to deal with the appalling health problems of Aboriginal people than seeking to improve the level of nutrition. The issue for people in remote areas, Mr Speaker, is a much more serious one in many respects uh, 
than those that live in the metropolitan area. It's one of the reasons, Mr. Speaker, that one has to uh, find oneself uh, rather shocked and amazed that the opposition, Mr. Speaker, should float, uh, as uh, indeed they have, the notion of a consumption tax, recognising that the cost of food uh, in the Kimberleys is already 40 per cent uh, above the cost in metropolitan area. Now, Mr. Speaker, when one goes to order, the, the member for O'Connor on a point of order. The Minister order. for Health the for firstly has no Does the member for O'Connor have a point of order? Yes, section 145 relevance. The minister was asked a very serious question order. about children's order. diet and order. has been the given a good O'Connor hearing. Will resume his Suddenly seat. he's on the consumption the member for tax O'Connor and that is will irrelevant. His seat. The minister is Get in back. order. I warn the member for well, O'Connor to cease interjecting. Perhaps it's, uh, perhaps it's not news in Western Australia, uh, Mr Speaker, that the concept of a consumption tax is being floated by the opposition, and simply the fact that I point out that when you go to the question of nutrition, a tax on food, a tax on food which is integral to a consumption tax, must have distributional consequences which uh, would worsen the situation that's already serious. The Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is uh, to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, the highest rate of unemployment in 1982 was 9.4 per cent, and the current Treasurer described the Australian economy in 1982 as being in depression. As unemployment is now 9.9 per cent and rising, on the Treasurer's own definition, is Australia now in a depression? The Honourable the Prime well, uh, Minister. Mr uh, Speaker, I'll come to uh, the uh, honourable gentleman's uh, definitions in a moment, but uh, let me uh, point out, Mr Speaker, uh, that the uh, peak of uh, unemployment uh, in the 1982-83 recession was, of course, uh, in double digits. I think it was 10.4 per cent. And, of course, Mr Speaker, let me point out, if you'd had the participation, if you'd had the participation rate then that you've got now, it would have been about 14.5 per cent. Uh, so uh, don't take any comfort from that. But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, it's very interesting to note uh, that uh, the uh, honourable uh, gentleman has uh, now produced uh, uh, an index in which he uh, purports that uh, he can uh, draw some comfort in regard to the government's uh, performance vis-à-vis -vis, uh, the opposition in these matters. Now let me say before I go to the details of this uh, subject, Mr. Speaker, that of course no one. Uh, can draw any joy at all out of the recent increases un in unemployment. I have said, the Treasurer has said and uh, relevant ministers have said uh, that we deeply regret the hurt that has been caused as a result of the necessary economic decisions that we've taken. Mr Speaker, very unfortunately in this uh, country today, the opposition, and particularly the shadow Treasurer, are taking every opportunity to talk down the Australian economy. As they, they gleefully, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Order. they gleefully greet, gleefully greet any bad news, dismiss any good news, and their latest uh, performance, uh, Mr. Speaker, the latest performance is the so-called misery index uh, that's been produced uh, by uh, uh, by the uh, gentleman who asked the question. Now, Mr. Speaker, it's very interesting that uh, according to uh, popular economics where this misery index has been used, the fact is, Mr Speaker, that the misery index has traditionally been the sum, the sum of the inflation rate and the unemployment rate. And on that basis, Mr Speaker, the traditional misery index that's been used, that uh, index peaked in 1982-83 at over 21. And uh, in the December quarter of last year, Mr Speaker, it was 15. In other words, the traditional misery index peaked in your recession at 21. It was 15 in December of this uh, December quarter of last year, and it's likely, Mr. Speaker, that it will remain that that index will remain broadly unchanged with the release of the uh, March quarter CPI tomorrow. So, Mr. Speaker, quite clearly, the traditional misery index didn't suit the member for Flinders. That was, that, that was no good to him, because when you use the traditional misery index, it revealed 21 for you, 15 in December under this government. So that didn't fit the opposition's rhetoric, Mr Speaker, the traditional misery index. So, uh, so undeterred by that, they decided to invent one of their own. And uh, Mr Speaker, 
It was released over the weekend by the member for Flinders. Now, it should be dubbed, of course, the Wreath Index because uh, wreath and misery are synonymous, Mr. Speaker. We're told, we're told, Mr. Speaker, we are told that this creation of the Shadow Treasurer is made up, it's made up of unemployment, Mr. Speaker, it's made up, we're told, of unemployment, inflation, interest rates, taxation and foreign debt. Of course, we're not told how it's compiled, Mr. Speaker. But one can only, uh, only assume, of course, coming from that source, that the figures are arranged in a way that provides the best light from the coalition's point of view. So it's not a great uh, surprise, Mr Speaker, that when you have a look at this uh, index that's been released by the member for Flinders, well, I don't mind showing you because I'm going to demolish it. There it is. There it is. Now, Mr Speaker, when you look at this, when you look at this uh, index, you will find, Mr Speaker, that uh, Order. Just looking at it, you'll find that from 1983 to 1991, the graph seems to show, Mr. Speaker, that the index rose by the order of 35%. Now that's the that's the figures that uh, you produced at your index, and it seems on your uh, on your index to have gone up from 1983 to 1991, order. gone up here, Mr. Speaker, the by the, the order of 35%. Now, what, did, what does surprise you, Mr Speaker, Order. when you have a look at this index, you'll find that uh, the shadow treasurer included Order. the figures, included the figures, Mr Speaker, for the, the period... The member for Young will cease interjecting. The member for Mayo will cease interjecting, as will the member for Benelong. Order. There, there is far too much interjection on my left. The member for Mayo has been a persistent interjector throughout throughout this order throughout this week throughout this order members on my right will cease interjecting the member for mayo has been a persistent interjector throughout this week i have called him to order on a number of occasions this week i have called him to order again if the member for mayo persists in interjecting i will name him without warning the Honourable the Prime Minister. Now, Mr Speaker, as I was saying, if you look at this uh, so-called index, you find in the period from 83 to uh, 91 that it rose by 35 per cent. Mr Speaker, if you look at the period from 1975 to 1983, the period for which they had responsibility, the misery index produced by this gentleman increased by 50 per cent. In other words, in their period of office, a 50 per cent increase, a 35 per cent increase under this, uh, under this government, Mr Speaker. Now, the uh, member for Flinders uh, can't even, out of his own production, Mr. Speaker, produce a case which would establish that there has been uh, uh, a degree of uh, incompetence in regard to the production of misery greater on this side than on his own. We don't accept, Mr. Speaker, uh, the uh, the compilation of the index. But all I'm saying is that, on the face of it, you did infinitely worse in your period of office than we have done in ours. But the, po the important point, Mr Speaker, is this, that by the production of these sorts of indices, by the way they get up in this House, they attempt to produce the impression that they have some sort of compassion for those who are in this community suffering the uh, from the uh, current economic difficulties. The fact is, Mr Speaker, that nothing could be further from the truth. You simply have to ask yourself the question, what is it? that those opposite want to do which will impact upon these people about whom they are speaking. And there are four things, Mr Speaker. First of all, they would, first of all, as I said in this House yesterday, Mr Speaker, they would abolish, they would abolish unemployment benefits after nine months, throw people under the dole. Secondly, secondly, Mr Speaker. Order. Secondly, Mr Speaker. Order. Secondly, Mr Order. Speaker. They would introduce. Order. Secondly, Members Mr. Speaker, they we'll would introduce a voucher system for education and for health. Thirdly, Mr. Speaker. Thirdly, Order. Mr. Speaker. Thirdly, Mr. Speaker, they would introduce an inflationary consumption tax, and they then, Mr. Speaker, we found out in this House last week that, in regard to workers in this country who would be required to undertake uh, a whole process of restructuring, retraining, undertaking uh, reforms that would bring in enormous productivity increases in this country, we find that the position of those opposite is that the reward of those workers would be exactly nothing. They would get nothing, Mr Speaker. They criticised in this House, 
order. By way, order. By way of interjection last week, Mr. Speaker, they said in regard to the waterfront that waterside workers should get no increase at all for a situation where they produced a 60 per cent increase in productivity. Now, that's the sort of, that's the sort of compassion. That's the sort of compassion, Order. Mr. Speaker, that Order. these people have. It is, it is a charade, it is mass hypocrisy, Mr. Speaker, to suggest that in respect of those opposite, they have the beginning of compassion for those people in this community who are suffering as they are in these present tough economic circumstances. Everything that the opposition are saying that they would do would compound the misery of these people and give no incentive whatsoever to any worker in this country to undertake the reform which is necessary to make for a more competitive economy in this country. The Honourable Member for Prospect. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I address my question, Mr Speaker. Order. Order. Ha, ha. My question, Mr Speaker, without notice, is to the Treasurer and Deputy Prime Minister. I ask the Treasurer, is he aware of recent comments comparing Australia's Order. economic position now with the position in 1986? Can the Treasurer advise the House as to the accuracy of these comments and provide details of the structural economic progress which has been made since 1986? Order. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Well, I can't. Mr Speaker. Order. The member, the member for Benelong will cease interjecting. The shadow, the shadow Treasurer is afraid to question me, so obviously uh, the uh, government backbench feels that they should take up the, uh, the running. Uh, Mr, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, um, today the shadow Treasurer said. Today, the shadow treasurer said, "Well, unfortunately, sadly, the Australian economy is much worse today," and uh, he was referring to remarks I made five years ago. The essence of those remarks were never, never about the cyclical position of the economy at that time. They were simply about the structural position. And I said, uh, "And uh, what they said? Uh, yes, I did. I said just that." No, no, I'll read it out to you. Order. Order. There is far too much noise. The member for Gippsland will cease interjecting. Let me read it to you. An extract said, What we inherited in 1983 was not just a budget deficit but a massive current account problem, a totally uncompetitive economy. And I said uh, earlier in that interview, if this government cannot get the adjustment, get manufacturing going again, keep moderate wage outcomes and a sensible economic policy, then Australia is basically done for. Now, now, Mr. Speaker, the I've fact warned is, the member Mr. for Gippsland. Speaker, the fact is, Mr. Speaker, those changes have been, those structural changes have been very profound. Let me let me refer to read some of them. The Prime Minister has referred to many of them. But let the me just go McKellar. to the principal one. On the balance of payments, the balance of merchandise trade in April 1986 was a deficit of 675 million for the month. In March 1991, it was a surplus of 615 million for the month. That is a shift from a deficit of 675 million in merchandise trade to the month to a surplus of 615 million for the month. On the balance of goods and services, on the balance of goods and services, oh, they don't like it. They don't like it. On the balance of goods and services, in April 1986, Mr. Speaker. That balance was a deficit of 952 million for the month. In March 1991, the latest available figures, it is for a surplus of 231, from a deficit of 952 to a surplus of 231. On merchandise exports from May 1986 to March 1991, monthly merchandise exports have increased by 18 per cent, 13 per cent per annum, annum average annual rate of improvement. Manufactured exports, as distinct from merchandise exports, from May 86 to March 91, monthly manufactured exports have increased by 178 per cent. That's per month, 178 per cent. That's a 23.6 per cent per annum average annual rate of improvement in manufactured exports. Now, if we're talking about structural change, we must be talking about manufactured exports, merchandise exports, 
balance of goods and services and balance on merchandise trade, all a huge, vast change. On the current account deficit, Mr Speaker, in April 86 to March 91, the monthly current account deficit improved by 24 per cent. In terms of GDP, another measure, uh, off the balance of payments and on to GDP, constant price, seasonally adjusted GDP increased by 15 per cent on a quarterly basis from the June quarter of 86 to the December quarter of 1990. In the same period, Mr Speaker, GDP per head increased by 7 per cent. That's GDP per capita by 7 per cent. Employment, total employment seasonally adjusted has increased by 11 per cent from May 86 to April 1991. And if we look at inflation, the Prime Minister covered, covered the inflation uh, figures adequately when he said the, uh, when he said the, the uh, CPI quarterly change in the same period for the year before, the June quarter 86 was 9.8 per cent and to the December quarter 1990 it was 6.88 at an underlying rate, as he said, of 5.4 per cent. On investment, capital expenditure, constant prices, seasonally adjusted all industries total has increased by 23 per cent, 23 per cent from the March quarter of 86 to the December quarter of 1990. So if you're listening to a retinue of structural change, if you think you're hearing it, you're right, you're hearing it. Change in public spending. Changes in public spending. In the 85-6 outlays were 30 per cent of GDP, revenues were 27. In 1989-90 outlays were 23.6 per cent of GDP and revenues 25.8. On a radio program today, Mr Speaker, the Shadow Treasurer was asked about the 7 per cent of GDP and 30 billion, which I had said a day or two earlier, had been given to the private sector to invest. Ruth. Well, he'll never tell us how he worked out that 30 billion, you know, because it's just a figure plucked from, plucked from thin air. I mean, I mean the deceit of that answer, Mr. Speaker. That is, we've taken, out, we've taken outlays down from 30 per cent of GDP to just under 24, 23.6, 7 per cent of GDP. GDP is running in the order of 400 billion. Seven times that is 28 billion. In round figures 30, that's where the number came from, as you well know, with your dishonest answers. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, in terms of, uh, in, in terms of revenue, revenue over the period fell 6.4 per cent of GDP. Outlays fell 6.4, revenue by 1.2 per cent of GDP. Now, in terms of international comparisons, the shadow treasurer had this to say. He said in this interview this morning that Australia he said was going, whilst everyone else has been going well, we've been going backwards. According to the OECD, between 86 and 90, the following cumulative GDP increases were recorded. Japan, 23 per cent. Australia, 16 per cent. Germany, 14 per cent. Italy, 14 per cent. UK, 14 per cent. Canada, 13 per cent. US, 12 per cent. France, 11 per cent. So far from going backwards, while well, everyone else has been going well, Mr. Speaker, Australia has had a faster rate of growth than all of the big seven economies other than Japan. That nails that lie. That nails that lie. That nails that lie. Now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, so when when I when I made these references to the fact we inherited in '83 not just a budget deficit but a massive current account problem, a totally uncompetitive economy, in that interview in 1986. Those statistics, the balance of payments, balance of goods and services, merchandise exports, manufactured exports, the current account de deficit, the GDP measures, the employment, inflation, investment, change in public spending and international comparisons nail the lie, and I table the statistics. The Honourable Member for North Sydney. <coughs> Mr Speaker. I direct a question without notice to the Minister for Arts, Sport, Environment, Tourism and Territories. Uh, I ask the Minister, does she agree with the view exp expressed by the leader of the National Party in New South Wales, Mr Walt Murray, that the proposed toxic waste incinerator should be located in Sydney? Are any sites in the Sydney area being considered as a possible location for the incinerator, and if so, what are they? Will the Minister rule out Sydney as a possible site for the toxic waste incinerator? The Honourable Minister. 
the Leader of the National Party on a point of order. Clearly, the very the first part of that uh, question is asking for an out and out opinion, and understanding orders is out of order, and you should so rule. Right. The rest of the question was in order. The Honourable the Minister. First part was out of order. Well, the, Honourable, can... the Honourable, if the Leader of the National Party would like me to ask the member for North Sydney to rephrase his question, I'll be happy to do that. Well, because I think on what the, the Minister will answer the question. I can assure the House that, unlike uh, Mr Murray, I will not be giving an opinion. I'll be outlining a process. And I think that's the point. And I think that's the point of the exercise. Because, because what has happened is that currently there is underway a process which has been agreed to by the New South Wales government as well as by the Commonwealth government and I understand also by the opposition and the Victorian government and every other environment minister in this country a process to try and find a site for a high temperature incinerator. Now the process that is underway is a process that is laid down in New South Wales legislation. Where, but whereby we will be doing an environmental assessment on seven sites that have been selected. The process, the process will be conducted by an independent panel of four people. The four people are Professor Charles Kerr, who is Professor of Preventive and Social Medicine at the Sydney University, Wendy MacArthur, Executive Director of the National Trust, Dr Ben Salinger from the Department of Chemistry at the ANU, and Michael Davidson, former president of the National Farmers Federation. So those four people are there to oversee the process. Now the process, the first part of that process now is to examine the technical aspects of the seven sites. One of the other parts of the process is to also look at the whole concept of high temperature incineration and assess the concept of storage versus incineration. Now, it is unfortunate that Mr Wall Murray has made comments about the site. It just happens that some of those sites that have been selected are in his electorate. But on the other hand, but what Mr Murray has said is he doesn't object to the concept of an incinerator. He just objects to it being in his electorate. <laughs> but, but he is also part. But he is also, as deputy leader, is part and parcel of a process Order. Members that of the his opposition will cease The leader of the national and party. And I have to say that the New South Wales Environment Minister Tim Moore, spokesman, said yesterday, and I endorse this statement. He says the New South Wales government has been is locked into this process and will not be diverted from it. And I endorse that statement because it is a statement that is very important that we retain the integrity of the process, because it is a much more important process than the sectoral interests, the particular interests of Mr Wal Murray and his particular electorate. Because what we have in Sydney and in Melbourne, in, in electorates like Maribyrnong, in electorates like Botany, we have a disaster waiting to happen. Now it is right, nobody wants. Nobody wants high temperature incinerated, but the problem is we have had years of neglect in these areas of the environment and we have got this material Order. in storage. Process for is underway and it will be adhered to. The Honourable Member for Kennedy. Uh, thanks, Mr Speaker. And my question without notice is to the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy. Can the minister um, inform the House what role the government expect, expects farm organisations to play in assisting to overcome the difficulties currently being experienced in rural seats like Kennedy and the bush generally? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much. The um, question the Honourable Gentleman asks is a general one, um, and, uh, but it does reflect a very important matter, particularly during this um, situation of um, a downturn. Um, on a number of occasions in the last few months I've commented that, uh, on the desirability of a cooperative approach uh, between the Commonwealth and state governments and uh, between all pe people involved uh, in handling these, uh, the rural crisis. In relation to farm financial matters, for instance, there are many uh, parties involved, the Commonwealth Government, 
has a responsibility, which it is discharging through managing the economy so as to get sustainable reductions in interest rates and uh, also by providing targeted money for the individuals, individual farmers in crisis through the Rural Adjustment Scheme. The banks also have a responsibility. Last month, when I announced the increase in funds for the Rural Adjustment Scheme, I stressed the importance of the banks doing what they can to help in the present circumstances. And, uh, when I talked to the banks recently, they said that they would certainly involve themselves very much with the state rural adjustment authorities and also with the farm counselling service. And the banks have exhibited an indication that they will be flexible, and I would hope that they'd be very sympathetic to individual uh, clients because uh, the rural sector has an enormous capacity to recover, but we know the year ahead, particularly for wool, is going to be very difficult. Uh, the state governments are also involved because of their capacity to provide assistance for farm families which are financially strapped and through their ability to match carry-on loans under Part B of the Rural Adjustment Scheme. And uh, the Queensland and South Australian governments have been uh, very sympathetic in that regard. Advisors such as accountants, rural councillors and extension agents are involved because of the importance uh, that farmers having access to the best financial advice and skills possible. Now, after I announced the Rural Adjustment Scheme package last month, I was critical of the reception given to it by some state farm organisations. Uh, the New South Wales farmers, for example, um, seem intent on marginalising themselves with saying things which are just plainly wrong as well as politically motivated, and their attitude wasn't constructive, and uh, nor was it informative. The approach, on the other hand, of the National Farmers Federation has been professional, positive and broad-ranging. The National Farmers Federation can be proud of the fact that it has succeeded in helping uh, get farmers to understand macroeconomics, international trade, microeconomic reform and soil conservation. All of these topics are now well and truly on the agendas of farm organisations and therefore on the agendas of so many individual farmers. And I think there is a proper understanding that these are matters which really count for farmers and farm incomes. And I think uh, slowly it's starting to dawn on people, certainly not the National Party, but it is slowly starting to dawn on people that there needs to be a proper understanding that it is analysis, uh, that it is ideas that really count. Uh, lobbying, of course, is still uh, very, um, very active, and we understand that. Um, but it is ideas more than simply trying to exercise numbers or some of the crude thuggery um, that we often see exhibited with some of the farm organisations. And uh, I do give credit uh, to the National Farmers Federation because they are concentrating more and more on ideas. And I was pleased to see even. Mr Mac Drysdale, the incoming chairperson of the Wool Corporation, saying that uh, it is ideas that count a lot more rather than uh, crude politics. And I think while I'm on my feet I might uh, pay uh, credit to the outgoing president of the National Farmers yeah. Federation because John Allwright uh, has uh, succeeded in continuing to make the National Farmers Federation an adornment to rural politics uh, rather than carrying on with some of the uh, stupidity that the National Party has inculcated and encouraged in farm organisations for so many years to the detriment of farmers. The Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question without notice uh, is again to the Prime Minister, and I, I refer him to the remarks of the Treasurer about deception. Prime Minister, I refer to the Treasurer's statement after the 87 budget that this is the great coming of age of Australia and his comment after the, the May 88 uh, mini-statement. We have acted decisively to turn the situation around. And to his statement after the August 88 budget, this is the one which brings home the bacon. And finally, to his comment after, uh, after the 1990 budget, when commenting on recent times, he said, these were definitely the golden years of change. I asked the Prime Minister, given that by the end of this term, Labor will have been in office for 13 out of the last 20 years, I mean, how long do we have to wait before these golden times arrive? The Honourable the Prime Minister. If the uh, Honourable Gentleman had been listening, uh, uh, Mr uh, Speaker, he would have heard from the answers that I've given and that the, and, and that the uh, Treasurer has given. Order. Mr Speaker, let me repeat. If the Honourable Gentleman had been listening to the answers that have been given by myself and the Treasurer, he would have understood that fundamental changes have been initiated over this period of office that will mean that the Australian economy is going to be significantly more competitive in the future. The figures that I gave and that the Treasurer supplemented in regard to the enormous growth in uh, manufactured exports uh, would show, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, that the uh, 
uh, the changes that are necessary to make Australia more competitive have in fact uh, occurred. Let me, Mr Speaker, refer to uh, some uh, statistics. I hope I've got them here. I think I have. Um, Order. Mr Speaker, let me, uh, for instance, uh, refer, and I, I suppose these aren't reliable enough statistics because they only come from the OECD. But let's uh, look at this uh, table, uh, Mr Speaker. This is a table covering uh, the period uh, uh, from uh, 85 uh, to uh, 89, uh, which takes in the, uh, the period that you're talking about, the latest available statistics, and this, regard, uh, this relates to manufacturing employment, production and exports over this period. Now this is the, from the OECD. If we look at employment, if we look at employment uh, Mr Speaker, the figure for the OECD as a whole shows that manufacturing employment between 1985 and 1989 went from increased by 1 per cent in the OECD. 100 to 101. That was the OECD. In Australia, it moved from 100 to 109. And on a quick inspection, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think, in fact, that there was only one other country, one other country, which had a higher growth in manufacturing employment in that period, and that was Spain, where the index went from 100 to 113. So there you have it. In terms of manufacturing employment in this period, the OECD up by 1 per cent. Australia up by 9 per cent. If you look in terms of uh, production, the OECD, uh, the OECD moved from 100 to 120. Australia was above the OECD average. It went from 100 uh, to 121. Uh, Mr Speaker, if you look at the volume of exports, now this goes right to the heart of the question that was addressed to me. What sort of changes are happening? What fundamental changes are happening in regard to Australia's capacity to be a competitor in a, uh, an increasingly competitive world? This is what happened in regard, Mr Speaker, to export volumes. For, OECD, for the OECD as a whole, uh, the index went up from 100 in 1985 to 131. That's a 31 per cent increase for the OECD as a whole. Mr Speaker, Australia went from 100 to 179. That's in terms of the exports of manufactured goods. Against an OECD average of 31 per cent, we went up to 79. And again, on a quick inspection, only one, only one country, only one country in the OECD had a better performance, and that was the United States, which pipped us by 2 per cent. The United States went to 81, from 100 to 181. Now here you have again, Mr Speaker, the opposition trying to write Australia down. They don't want to acknowledge the enormous performance that's been made by Australia, better than any other country in the OECD in terms of the volume of exports of manufactured goods. What you ought to be doing is clapping and applauding that your country has done better than any other country in the OECD. That's what you ought to be doing. If you were concerned about your country, you wouldn't be trying to play it down. You would say, what a marvellous thing that only one country in the OECD, the United States, has done better than us. Well, I can say from this side of the House that we in government take pride in the fact that the great changes that we have overseen in this country have enabled this country to do better than any other country in the United States. And if you want to go on in the next two years trying to write your country down in the way you are now, you'll pay the price, and it'll be a deadly price that you'll pay in two years' time. The Honourable Member for Fraser. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Resources and concerns the current review of the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme. Can the Minister advise the House whether it's intended to have Australian Capital Territory participation in the review process? Is there any basis for the reported concern that electricity charges will increase as a result of the review? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, um, Mr Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for Fraser for his question and uh, place on record his continuing and close uh, interest and involvement in this important issue. The Snowy Mountain Scheme, as honourable members will be aware, is internationally regarded as, and properly so, as an engineering masterpiece and uh, something that uh, represents Australia's best endeavours. 
Uh, more than 100,000 people coming from over 30 countries contributed to its construction, and in scale and vision in this country, it really only has been uh, matched by the Northwest Shelf Project. Now, the scheme is governed by the Snowy Mountains Hydroelectric Agreement, under which it operates as a joint venture arrangement between the Commonwealth and the states of New South Wales and Victoria. In recent years, it has become increasingly evident that existing arrangements have major deficiencies, and consequently the aim of the review is to put in place new arrangements which will improve the efficiency of the scheme, simplify and modernise management and institutional structures, and provide for a proper rate of return on the scheme's assets. Now, the Commonwealth believes that as the Snowy Scheme provides around 30 per cent of the ACT's electricity, the ACT should be involved in the review process. However, the Snowy Mountains Agreement cannot be changed without the concurrence of all three parties, and both the governments of New South Wales and Victoria have consistently refused to allow the ACT to become involved in the review process. And of course, under the existing constitutional arrangements, unless uh, both New South Wales and Victoria change their position, uh, most unlikely in my view, it is regrettably not uh, possible for the ACT to be directly involved. Now, as to the uh, second part of the member's question, it's of course only speculation whether ACT electricity prices will rise until such time as a reform package is decided. However, I should stress that under existing arrangements, the scheme is almost totally reliant on borrowings for capital expenditure. And if the scheme is to maintain its role as Australia's premier provider of in environmentally benign peak load power, then on some estimates up to about $400 million will be needed to provide uh, uh, over the next 20 years uh, for major refurbishment of generating plant and equipment. Uh, my preferred view is that these funds should be generated internally from a proper rate of return on funds invested. Uh, as I indicated, that is precluded under the existing arrangements. Now, rectifying this will um, obviously require either increased prices um, for uh, some uh, constituents in Canberra <laughs> or increased efficiency and obviously to the extent possible um, a reliance on the latter, that is increased efficiencies, and I believe there is considerable room for improvement there, will dictate uh, less reliance on increased prices. Now, in the final analysis, uh, we'll be probably looking at a combination of both. Uh, but can I assure, assure the member for Fraser and the member for Canberra that the Commonwealth will continue to ensure that the ACT's interests are recognised in the negotiations and that the ACT is consulted on changes resulting from the review. And in conclusion, I think everyone in the House would agree that a scheme like the Snowy, with the massive investment uh, that the Australian people have placed in that uh, important scheme, uh, does require uh, a commitment by, uh, by everyone to ensure that over time the necessary refurbishment takes place that will ensure that uh, the Snowy goes into the next century as an important uh, entity in its own right, but perhaps uh, uh, even more importantly, as possible, possibly a central component of the emerging uh, developments in terms of a national electricity grid. The Honourable the Leader of the National Party. Mr Speaker, my question is directed without notice to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister would be aware of today's front page story in The Australian, which included the following analysis, and I quote, Australia has entered the dark world Mr Keating himself conjured up five years ago. Long-term high unemployment, low growth, social division, shattered confidence and talk of depression. Well, the Prime Minister sacked the man who made the prediction and who then blithely watched it all happen. And getting back to fundamentals, what hope, what encouragement and what future do you offer? to the 800,000 unemployed in these economic circumstances. Yeah. The Honourable Prime Minister. If I, had any, uh, if I had any choice in the sacking, it would be the sacking of the editor for such uh, misleading uh, uh, headlines, uh, Mr. Uh, but uh, Order. Order. that is not within my province. It's not within my province to deal with the editor of The Australian, and it is certainly within my province uh, to deal with the uh, Treasurer, and as far as the Treasurer is concerned, uh, 
uh, he will be uh, staying and doing uh, the job of treasurer, which has produced a situation. If you want to, uh, I'll play quotes with you. I mean, you've uh, quoted one paper. I'll try the uh, try the Sun Herald today. A bankers' trust chief uh, chief economist Stephen Miller said yesterday. The structure of the Australian economy was much better now than it was five years ago. Now, now, Order. The Leader of the oh, Opposition. Oh, I see. So, I warned uh, the member for Kuyong. So he should we're cease saying, interjecting. What we're saying, as usual, on the other side, Stephen Miller is a liar because he worked for the Treasurer. That's what we're saying. Good on you. OK, good on you. Anyone who's worked for anyone in this... Uh, I mean, I, I suppose, according to that logic, according to that logic, that uh, I should question any report coming out of, uh, of the Irish Embassy at the moment, because the person there worked for you. I mean, what, what a remarkable, pitiable, despicable logic that is. According to your logic, because someone has worked for the Treasurer, he is now incapable Order. of giving an honest report or an honest analysis. The, the inevitable logic of that is that I should instruct... I should inst Order. Oh. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. M M Mr Speaker, I simply point out to the Prime Minister the inconsistency the of his of argument opposition. when he attacks if me the... as being an advisor in the Fraser years. The Leader of the Opposition. Order. Uh, Mr. Mr. Order. In attacking the, Minister, in the, attacking the Leader might... of the Opposition Order. when he was advising Order. the Opposition. The Prime Minister might resume his seat sure. for a moment. The Leader of the Opposition should not take uh, frivolous points of order. If the, leader of the opposition, if the Leader of the Opposition has a point of order, he should make a point of order. He should not endeavour to interject into the debate by standing at the dispatch box. The Honourable the Prime Minister. And, Mr Speaker, let, 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 me dis, let me dismiss his interjection. May I say that when I referred to him when he was working for the, uh, when he was working for the then government, I was not questioning his honesty, only his competence. <laughs> now, uh, Mr Speaker, but let, 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 let me just make the point, just to show the the despicable depths to which these people opposite descend. We have now established the position that because a person has worked for someone in this government, their integrity is gone. You can't rely on what they've said, what they say subsequently, once they've worked for anyone on this side. Now, I simply say to you, according to the logic of that position, I should instruct the Minister for uh, Foreign Affairs to discount, disregard anything that comes out of uh, the Irish Embassy because the person there used to work for the Leader of the Opposition. You only have to state such a proposition to see what a despicable sort of uh, interjection came from that side. If you want to say that Stephen Miller is a liar and can't be relied upon, Order. say it. But you won't, be, you won't well, be casting any reflection on Stephen Miller, you'll be casting a reflection party. upon yourselves. So, uh, Mr Speaker, let me say in respect to the uh, question asked by the uh, Leader of the uh, National Party. I simply would say this, uh, if you're asking a question about social divisiveness, I would say that there has been no point in the post-war history of this country when there was greater social divisiveness in Australia than in 1983. This country, after seven years of Conservative government, had been reduced to a situation where there was no sense of co uh, social or economic cohesiveness. You would abandon any system, any concept of trying to have a sensible wages outcome which could result from discussions between employers and trade unions and government. You'd set yourself against workers, you'd set workers against employers, employers against workers. You'd had an 18 per cent blowout, which was the worst we'd seen in that period, and you had Australians set against Australian. There was never any period in the post-war history of this country of greater social divisiveness than that period over which you presided. We came into government. We called the summit in 83, and for the first time in the history of this country, we brought employers, we brought workers together. And as a result of that, the, uh, the uh, country has produced a situation under that era, that unprecedented era of cooperation, where these things have happened, which you couldn't even dream about, let, let alone start to produce. 11 per cent reduction in real unit labour cost, because people weren't at one another's throat. You had employers and trade unions and government sitting down together and working. You had a situation where you'd had a pitifully low profit level, profit division in this country, and because you had the trade unions sitting down cooperatively, working with employers and governments, you had a shift from wages to profits, something that you couldn't engineer because you'd set workers against their employers and one against the other and governments against a lot of them. Now, we changed that, and you've got a position where 
if you want to test it by uh, a pretty uh, well-known criterion, the level of industrial disputation. Not a bad sort of indicator as to what sort of degree of cohesiveness in the country. You brought industrial disputation under your government to unheard of levels. Under my government, industrial disputation has been reduced by 60 per cent compared to the period when you are in office. So whatever criterion you want to look at, whatever criterion you want to look at, I'll tell you how, how socially, co how socially cohesive you were when you were in office. Your concept of social justice of co social cohesion in this country was that one child out of three, one child out of three would stay on and go on to uh, year 12. And you know they weren't the kids, they weren't the kids of the poor and the lower middle income. They were the kids of the well-to-do in this country. That was your concept of social cohesiveness. That was your concept of offering hope. You couldn't for two, for, for two out of three of every Australian children. The hope that you held out to them was two out of three of you won't get to year 12. That was the hope you held out for Australian kids. And in eight short years, in eight short years, we've changed that from one out of three kids going on to year 12 to I being two out of three Gilmore. of kids going on to year 12. We've created 140,000 additional places in our universities so that they can go on and develop and train their talents. That's the hope that we hold out to kids. True it is that at the moment there is higher unemployment, but it is certain as a result of the basic changes that we've made in this country that with the lower inflation regime that we're bringing in, that this country will move out of recession in the second half of this year and you will go into a position where Australia will have rates of inflation comparable with its trading partners, where it will be infinitely more competitive than it's ever been before. And those kids who can now go to school and stay on in school that never could under you will have the opportunity of either going on to university or going into technical institutions or going into employment. They will have the chance that they've never had before under the Tories of this country to have an equal opportunity of having their talents trained. That's what we're doing about social cohesion in this country. The Honourable Member for Coria. Speaker, my question without notice is also to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister is aware that it is now over two months since the March 12 industry statement, in which he indicated that $40 million would be made available for assistance for those affected uh, by changes in the automotive plans. The Prime Minister also indicated that assistance to the textile and footwear industries would continue. I asked the Prime Minister, is he aware that there are now 2,500 persons who have lost their jobs in the automobile industry in the Geelong region and in excess of 2,000 in the textile, footwear and clothing um, industries in the two months since the March statement? When can, I, when can I expect and the people of Geelong expect positive announcements on the proposals which were contained in his statement for assistance? Order. The Honourable Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank, uh, I thank the Honourable Member for Corio for his question, and I, I say to him that the government recognises the uh, extent to which regions like Geelong have been affected by the downturn in the economy. As part, Mr. Speaker, as part of the uh, March the 12th uh, statement, my colleague, uh, uh, the Minister uh, John Dawkins, announced a comprehensive package. Uh, as the honourable member will recall, he announced a comprehensive package uh, to ease the effect of the recession on the labour market and uh, a number of options for providing help to those workers whose employment is affected by continuing structural change. Now, of these, uh, the measures most relevant are an expansion of the Office of Labour Market Adjustment, the introduction of the Passenger Motor Vehicle Labour Adjustment Package, the introduction of the Training and Skills Task Package and the Job Skills Program. The Office of uh, Labor Market Adjustment has been expanded with the primary objective, Mr Speaker, of improving the employment uh, futures of the individuals and the regions and industries affected by structural change. A package of assistance, uh, I can uh, say to the honourable uh, member, is currently being developed specifically for the Geelong region. An initial element of assistance was approved in mid-February 1991 for the training of retrenchees and unemployed for placement at Aerospace Technologies and Australian uh, Aircraft uh, Services at a cost of $300,000. Uh, 
Further elements of assistance are being developed uh, through e extensive community uh, consultation with a view to that package being finalised in uh, June of this year. The Passenger Motor Vehicle Labor Adjustment Package was introduced retrospectively from 1 February 1991 and it replaces the previous package of assistance to the industry under the Labor Adjustment Training Arrangements and it provides immediate assistance to retrenchees from the major plan producers and component manufacturers. Mr Speaker, up to $40 million has been allocated for the uh, Passenger Motor Vehicle Labor Adjustment Program from the period from the 1st of uh, February of this year to the uh, 31st of December 2000. There's already been some take up under the package and an increasing number of participants are expected to be assisted over the next two months. In addition, a labour adjustment package already exists for workers affected by reductions in assistance to the TCF industry. The adequacy of that package in assisting uh, displaced workers is presently under review. However, displaced workers can continue to access the package during the review period and under present arrangements, $50 million was allocated to the package to assist adjustments to 1995. The training and skills, that is the task program also announced, is designed to assist the employment retention and improve the skills base of employees who would otherwise be retrenched. Under task, assistance will be provided to companies from 1 July 1991, uh, I point out to the honourable member, for these purposes, for the development and delivery of a training package for the affected employees, and as a contribution towards a training wage which will be paid to employees while they are participating in training. Consultations and negotiations on this matter are currently being carried out with the peak union and employer bodies. $15 million has been allocated to the program in 1991-92, rising to $25 million in subsequent years. Now, while uh, I would say to the honourable gentleman, Mr Speaker, that the program will not formally commence until 1 July, Negotiations with the ACTU and peak employers on the concept of the training wage and the administrative arrangements for the program are well advanced and consultation in regions such as Geelong are being currently undertaken to identify enterprises with potential uh, for assistance from that date. The introduction of the new work experience and training program, Job Skills, is also the 1st of July of this year. Negotiations with unions and employers about the level of the proposed training wage are currently being conducted and further consultations will be held with individual state local government authorities, with Skillshare projects and other organisations which have the capacity to implement job skills. And Mr Speaker, may I conclude by saying to the honourable gentleman that as soon as the industrial, administrative and uh, program delivery arrangements are formalised, placements will commence under the program. The honourable member for Isaacs. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Is it a fact that more than 5,000 people lined up in Melbourne recently to try to gain employment at a new department store which is not due to open for more than five months? How can the Prime Minister explain to the average Australian and the people in my electorate that this is the recession we had to have? And what can the Prime Minister offer to these people trying to survive in the depths of the worst depression since the 1930s. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I won't uh, burden the Honourable Member for Isaacs with the uh, list of uh, programs uh, that uh, are in place as distinct from uh, the situation when you people uh, brought in the recession of 1982-83. There is a range of programs, and if the Honourable Gentleman is not aware of them, I will uh, undertake to submit to him a, a total list of the uh, training uh, packages and programs that are available to assist those who at this time are unemployed. There has been an unparalleled expenditure by this government on such programs. And uh, I'm not surprised, Mr Speaker, in response to the first part of the Honourable Gentleman's question, uh, that a very large number of people are seem to be queuing up for that and for other jobs, because if you have got unemployment at the level you've got at the moment, of course you're going to have people queued up for jobs. But as distinct, Mr uh, Speaker, as I've said earlier this week, uh, from the attitude of the party to which you belong and to which you're committed, we don't adopt the position that when people are disadvantaged by the change in economic circumstances that you throw them on the scrap heap. 
what your party did, what your party did, and uh, let me remind you, let me remind you, so that you have uh, no doubt at all as to what your policy is in this area. You not only created record unemployment, but then you delivered. Order. Oh. The honourable member for Isaacs on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I did ask a specific question in relationship to the 5,000 people and issues in Isaacs. Not for the Does Prime the Honourable Minister Member to talk have a point of order? My political party Does the did. Honourable Member have a I warn the Honourable Member for Isaacs that if he if if order oh, Members of the Opposition will cease interjecting. If the Honourable Member for Isaacs wishes to take a point of order, he should do it in the form of the House, not just attempt to join in the debate. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Uh, Speaker, I, I'm not surprised at all that the Honourable Gentleman doesn't want to hear the facts about his own party. You ask me uh, uh, what uh, we could offer, and I'm telling you, and by way of uh, substantiating the virtue and the merit of what we can offer, it is a very relevant uh, thing to point out that this is substantially different from what you and your party have not only done in the past but what your principles still are. Now, what you did was to create record unemployment, but instead, instead in that situation of having some compassion for those that you threw out of work, you deliberately reduced in real terms, you deliberately reduced in real terms the benefits that would be available to them. And let me remind the House again, Mr Speaker, of precisely what the philosophy of those opposite is in regard to this matter. In the period when you were in office before, leading up to those record levels of unemployment, what did you do in regard to people who depended upon you in government to be able to, looked after, to be looked after in times of difficulty? I'll go through the list. It's not only those who are unemployed, and looking up to the ceiling won't save you from your sins because this is a matter of record. Now, Mr. Speaker, let's look at the position of the sole parent. Let's look at the position of the sole parent with two kids. What did you do? I tell you how compassionate you were for that category, for that most disadvantaged category of society. You reduced the real value of the benefit by 4%. This government has increased it by 32% in real terms. What did you do, as I said the other day, for the married pensioner with two kids? Your concept of compassion was to do this, to deliberately reduce the real value of their benefit by 2 per cent in real terms. That's what your concept of compassion was. Well, I tell you what our concept of compassion is. It's been to increase the real value by 26 per cent. You reduced it by 2 per cent. We've put it up by 26 per cent. And the unemployed single adult, what was your concept of compassion for the unemployed single adult? I'll tell you what it was, to reduce the benefit by 19 per cent in real terms. That was your concept of compassion. Our concept of compassion for that person uh, renting privately has been to increase the real benefit by 54 per cent. The single pensioner, what was your concept of compassion? Reduce the real benefit by 2 per cent. Our concept of compassion has been to increase it in real terms by 21 per cent. What about the married pensioner couple with uh, no dependents? Your concept of compassion was to reduce it by 2 per cent in real terms. Our concept of compassion is to increase it by 18 per cent. So if you want to know about uh, what the difference is between your party, your philosophy, this government and its philosophy, you will find, you will find it stark and clear. Not only did you create the record levels of unemployment, but you kicked them in the guts by reducing the real value of benefits. Now, as far as we and that, and that represents not only your policy, but it represents your philosophy. As far as this side of politics is concerned, we are different in terms of policy because we're different in terms of philosophy. Our philosophy is that if people in the community become disadvantaged through no fault of their own, then the community will increase the real benefits available to them. That's what we've done. That's what we'll continue to do. And when the time comes to be judged in 1993, I'll come down to Isaacs with you and you'll get rolled. The Honourable Member Mr. for Speaker. Philip. Mr Speaker, I, I seek leave to move. Order, I've called the Honourable Member for Philip. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. She was, the Honourable Member was on her feet. The Honourable Thank Member you, for Mr. Philip. Speaker. 
My, my question is addressed to the Minister for uh, Transport and Communications, and I ask whether. Order. And I ask whether he's aware of a study done by the Australian Broadcasting Tribunal into the um, implementation of new program standards for Australian television. And I wonder if you can let the House know how the commercial broadcasters are implementing the new standards. The Honourable Minister. I thank the Honourable Member for Philip for a question, not least because it yet again exposed the inadequacies of the Leader of the Opposition in his comprehension of the forms of the House. <laughs> but, uh, Indeed, uh, very good progress has been made in implementation of the standards brought down by the ABT uh, uh, last, uh, last year. And uh, it's been done in circumstances which I think uh, uh, show that the, uh, the licensees in these difficult times are deserving of substantial credit for what they've managed to do. You'd recollect that the quota which came into force on the 1st of January 1990 set a transmission quota of something like 35 per cent for Australian product, Australian programs, rising by 5 per cent per annum to 50 per cent in 1993. Uh, every service uh, screened more than 40 per cent Australian content, and 30 of the 43 services exceeded 50 per cent in the standards first year, making an average level of Australian content between 6, 6 a.m. and midnight of 52 per cent. All licensees met the requirements for Australian drama, including children's drama and diversity programs. Diversity programs shown by licensees included social documentaries, new concepts, news and current uh, affairs, specials and variety. And this was in addition to a range of Australian drama and children's drama. The tribunal regards the results as a positive sign of the ability of the television industry to provide pro Australians with a diverse range of Australian programming. And I think it should also provide some encouragement to the production industry that there is continuing commitment to locally made programming. The, the Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I move, that so, I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition moving forth with the following motion. But this House censures the Prime Minister for his lack of leadership and failure in economic policy which has put a million Australians out of work sent thousands of businesses broke and pushed Australia five years further down the road to a banana republic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Oh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. I move, oh, I move that this House censures the Prime Minister for his lack of leadership and order, failure in order, economic policy. Order, order. The question is that standing orders be suspended. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Unanimous. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I move that this House censures the Prime Minister for his lack of leadership and failure in economic policy, which has put a million Australians out of work, sent thousands of businesses broke and pushed Australia five years further down the road to a banana republic. Mr Speaker, it's a very serious matter when the Opposition decides to move censure on the Prime Minister. <laughs> And we've had a classic display in the course of question time today of the uh, well, disgraceful display in the course of question time today of an attempt by the Prime Minister to fob off their failure over the last five years. Failures to hear the, war the warning, the very clear warning that the Treasurer gave this country quite co correctly in May of 1986, just five years ago today. And the great tragedy of the last five years is that, uh, in a sense, the 14th of May 1986 was the Treasurer's finest hour. Of course, he had created in that statement a unique opportunity to focus the minds of the government and the people of Australia on the magnitude of our economic problems. So for that, for that particular reason, it's a significant tragedy that, no, that there's been a, a fundamental failure of leadership since that time. And secondly, he created a unique opportunity to build a constituency for change, which is very difficult to be known in this country. You get very few opportunities to get the attention of the electorate as to the magnitude of the problem and to build a constituency, which emerged following that statement, to make substantial change. And the fact that that uh, warning wasn't heeded has seen our country now slide through bad economic management and appalling leadership into the worst recession in, um, in uh, 60 years. And as we saw today in the parliament, 
The Prime Minister and the Treasurer have got no concept, absolutely no concept, of the pain and hardship that's being felt by average Australians today. They got up in the House uh, sequentially. Uh, the uh, Treasurer's um, pride somewhat hurt that he wasn't able to get the call first, but got up sequentially and listed a whole string of boring statistics, boring statistics selectively quoted to try and demonstrate the fact that they hadn't failed in economic management in the course of the last five years. And as you go through the statistics that both of them listed, it's very easy to knock over their case. They pick, for example, underlying rates of inflation rather than the actual rate of inflation. And forget to mention that why wouldn't inflation fall in the midst of the deepest recession in 60 years? You'd be appalled if it didn't. Three quarters of a million jobs, the Prime Minister said, he's created. But they're on the way out. We now have 844,000 people unemployed uh, on, one ba on a CES basis, a million people looking for work, and upwards of a million other people who've been pushed onto some other sort of benefit or are unable to work more than about 15 hours a week. They selectively quoted data on the balance of payments, but forgot to mention the fact that the current account deficit <coughs> has increased from about $12 billion to about $18 billion. And it doesn't matter, really, uh, Treasurer, that the, uh, the current that the trade account has started to improve in the midst of the deepest recession in 60 years because the country is now locked in a debt trap. It's deeply in a debt trap where the great bulk of this year's current account deficit is going to be paying interest on the accumulated deficits of the past several years. And so you can go on through all the um, statistics that both of them quoted, and many of them deliberately misrepresenting, talking about investment booms which no longer survive, and indeed we're looking at the first uh, significant fall in our capital stock on record in the course of this year, focusing attention on uh, micro-reform, uh, which uh, was to which they were unable to uh, document or provide the detail of that significant uh, shift. So very selectively quoted uh, data to substantiate their case. Right. But the most disturbing thing, when uh, subject to interjection and so on uh, from our side in the course of uh, question time today, the Prime Minister then turned on us and used the last refuge of the scoundrel, yeah. patriotism, right. turned on us and said that we were talking our country down. It's not a question of talking our country down, Prime Minister. It's a question of facing reality before Australia is finally written off. It is a question of facing reality before Australia is finally written off. It is not a question of talking our country down. And as I say, the tragedy of uh, May the, 6th, uh, the 14th, uh, 1986, was, it was on one occasion where the Treasurer got it right and nobody in your government listened to him and you've pushed Australians now into the worst recession they've seen in the course of 60 years. And so it's for that reason, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we feel it is fundamentally important to bring the Prime Minister to account for his government's negligence and his government's incompetence in meeting the challenge which his, his Treasurer identified back there in early 1986. Second, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think it's important for us on this side of the House to start to voice the mood of disillusionment and the mood of anger that exists out there in Australia as, as the people of Australia struggle in the circumstances that have been created by the government's incompetence and neglect. And finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think it's fundamentally important that we try and bring the Prime Minister back to reality, to understand the magnitude of our problems and to understand the hard, hard choices and the leadership that is required in order to turn our country around. He's shown no capacity for leadership in the course of the last five years. He's shown a particularly appalling lack of capacity for leadership since the last election. But if we look back over those five years, he and his government have, have had a very significant number of opportunities to actually put in place the correct policies. There's five budgets, four mini-budgets, one major industry statement, six premiers' conferences, and a host of other policy statements and, uh, and uh, summits and talk fests and reviews and consultations and processes of advice, none of which have led to this government either facing reality or to this government to, to, starting to take the decisions that are required to turn our country around. So Prime Minister worries, as we've heard on many occasions as recently as yesterday, that he worries about his place in history. His real place in history will be to record the fact 
that he wasted the last five years. He wasted a very real opportunity created by his treasurer to put our country on the path to an improved international standing, an improved status in terms of living standards, an improved status in terms of our credit rating, an improved status in terms of our significance in our region and in the rest of the world, but he chose instead, by neglect and incompetence, to push us down the Argentinian road. And we are now five years further down that road than otherwise would have been the case. Now, there are many, of course, examples of this Prime Minister's lack of leadership, but perhaps the most telling example is the fact that he will not face the reality of the failures of his Treasurer. Anybody else in any other position in this country performing the way the Treasurer has performed in the course of the last five years would have been given their marching orders a long time ago. And he can't understand that. But the people of Australia can't understand how it is that you sit there and, and applaud the Treasurer and talk about his beautiful performance and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, neglect the fact that he has inflicted more pain and hardship on average Australians than any other Treasurer in the history of this country. You've allowed him to get away with constant breaches of Cabinet solidarity in terms of attacking his colleagues. You allow him to wander all over the place, undermining you. You've shown an appalling lack of leadership in dealing with that Treasurer. You've shown an appalling lack of leadership in not being able to bring either your front bench or your back bench under control. And on any policy issue these days as it emerges, you've got as many views as, as there are people on your side of the parliament openly speaking to the gallery and uh, to whoever will listen to them about their particular views on policy. You've, uh, most importantly, though, shown an appalling lack of understanding of what's in the national interest. How is it that in the midst, for example, of the worst crisis in 60 years, you can play politics with projects like Coronation Hill, or you can play politics with projects like Wesley Vale, or you can, you can say that you're reforming telecommunications while you're protecting the monopolistic-based feather-bedded jobs of your mates in, the te in, in telecom, or you can claim that you're cleaning up the waterfront and embarked on a major program of waterfront reform when you're only really protecting your mates in the union leadership and, uh, and uh, in the Waterside Workers' Federation. You have shown only one capacity in terms of uh, government in the last five years, and that is looking after your mates. You have put mateship above leadership to the point where it's become a national disgrace and embarrassment. And uh, the best example I can give you of that is your performance in the last several weeks in relation to your mate Brian Burke. When everyone else in the country could see that Brian Burke had to go, and even Brian Burke, in his moment of disgrace, had a better concept of what is right than you did, but you couldn't bring yourself to show the leadership that is essential to turning our country around. You preferred to stand by the mateship. It only begs the question, what hold has Brian Burke got over you? Uh, secondly, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, we've seen uh, wasted years in terms of the rhetoric that this man has embarked on and the failure to deliver action. And just one quote, we can go back to his address to the nation, his war address of the 11th of June 1986, when he said, I will not shirk the hard decisions that are necessary to ensure a bright future for us and for our children. Well, go tell that to the million people that are unemployed out there today. And tell that to the, uh, to the uh, 800,000 babies that uh, Australians that have been born in the last five years or to the more than 500,000 migrants that have arrived in the last five years. I was walking through the Doncaster shopping centre the other day in Melbourne, and a woman stopped me and identified herself as a migrant of uh, the Menzies period. And she said, do you know, if I arrived today, I would get back on the next boat and go home, and begged me to do what we could to get rid of those two wonderful characters, Hawke and Keating. And that is the feeling that exists in the migrant community, large parts of the migrant community today. They came here to build a country and build an opportunity for their children, which they now can't, can't guarantee their children, and they are very concerned about the future of their children and their children's children. Because in the last five years alone, the bottom line of your economic incompetence has been that our debt levels internationally have risen from about $92 billion to $165 billion. You have knowingly mortgaged the future of those children uh, in, uh, as a result of the incompetence of your economic, uh, your economic management. 
And all through the last five years, we've been subjected to a barrage, as we were again today, of rhetoric about how you can take the tough decisions, and yet we can't identify one tough decision you've taken in the course of the last five years. And the bottom line is debt keeps going up, and pain and hardship of the average Australians reflects the fact that you can't take the decisions that are required to turn this country around. The third disturbing feature, the third disturbing feature of, uh, of the wasted years, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the fact that this economic crisis was not inevitable. This economic crisis could have been avoided. This was an economic crisis of this government's own making. Not, uh, can't be blamed on what happened in the rest of the world. Can't be blamed on anybody else. It's the, we, we slake the blame directly, directly to the Prime Minister and his Treasurer, who were in full control of the economic circumstances over the last five years. And I think the key point that uh, we can make in this regard is just to look back over those five years at how they consistently misread the economic circumstances, or they tried to manipulate economic circumstances for political ends. And the combination of those two things has created the fundamental mess uh, on which, uh, uh, that we today observe in our economy. They've missed, for example, the significance of the pick-up in the terms of trade in December 1986. They then played politics in 1987 and 88 by trying to force interest rates down in the run-up to the federal election and the New South Wales election in early 88. And they then reluctantly saw that they had to do something and chose one instrument to do it, interest rates, and that blunt instrument has been the source of the principal source of the, the recession that they have imposed over and above all the structural problems the Treasurer was talking about back in early 1986. It is a crisis in this country in terms of expectations and it is a crisis of confidence. People have been consistently told that things are better than they are. The government has never once stood up and had the courage to tell the truth about the nature of our circumstances and the direction in which we were going. And uh, now they've driven those people to a state of total despair. The lucky country is now the frustrated and angry country as a consequence of the Prime Minister's gross incompetence and lack of leadership. And for the first time, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are looking at the possibility of the current generation of Australians leaving a lower standard of living to their children than they themselves enjoyed. And that is what concerns people. That is what concerns people uh, in the rest of this country, beyond uh, the confines of this place and the artificiality of Canberra. They understand the magnitude of the problems that have been imposed on them by this government's incompetence. Of course, every time you pressure the government, the Treasurer and the Prime Minister, for reasons, uh, uh, for uh, explanations as to why things have happened, you just get a barrage of excuses get a barrage of uh, irrelevant uh, excuses and broken promises. Prime Minister talks in the past. I mean, in almost every question today, he referred back to the Fraser years. We are eight years on from the Fraser years. There's no reason to live in the past. The people of Australia want you to look to the future. The people can't understand why you always live in the past. Or you boast about the fact that you created one and a half million jobs. They all know you borrowed the money to do that. And any fool can create jobs by borrowing money at about $70,000 in debt per job. You know, the average wage of about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 would have been cheaper to just give them the money than run up that much debt in order to create those jobs. Any fool can do that. And they know that in doing that and in boasting about that, you've mortgaged the future of their children. And, uh, of course, uh, you go on with these uh, artificial comparisons of the social wage and the benefits that were given under the Fraser year compared to under you. And you attack us for a lack of compassion. There is nothing more, there is nothing that reveals a lack of compassion than the way you have managed the, mismanaged the economy in the course of the last five years. There's nothing more compassionate you can do for a person in Australia than to give them a job and create the opportunity for them to have a job and to better themselves and to raise their standard of living and give their children a better standard of living than they in fact enjoyed themselves. And you talk about uh, compassion and you go away and uh, play games with environmental issues and resource issues and immerse them in a pile of uh, red tape and green tape and black tape. But you do not, you do not, you do not understand. You know, it's a good line because it goes to the very heart of your incompetence. Do you realise that there's a whole string of mineral projects that wouldn't get off the ground today under you? Hammersley Iron Ore, for example, Northwest Shelf, 
None of those projects would get off the ground because of what you're making light of, red tape, green tape and black tape. You can't even take a soft option decision like Coronation Hill and you pride yourself that you can take tough decisions around this place. So what we are left with is a government that is riddled with division, with, with no sense of direction, with no vision for the future, with a Prime Minister that only looks to the past, lived in, lives in the past and uh, pretends that none of these current problems exist, and a Prime Minister who persistently has put mateship over leadership in everything he's done. Well, Prime Minister, I think you should start to answer some questions to average Australians. I mean, you should start telling the 844,000 people who have lost their job when they can expect to get another job. That's a reasonable question on, on the part of those people who are now desperately concerned that they perhaps are looking at an economy that is locked into over 10 per cent unemployment for years to come. And you should tell some of the small business people in Australia when they can expect to recoup their savings and their wealth that you've stripped off them through high interest rates and the collapse of those businesses. Or to the farmers who are in the worst rural crisis since the 1930s. They want you to show a bit of genuine compassion and deal with the structural problems that have been impacting on their industry and the impact of high interest rates and uncompetitive exchange rates that have reduced the earnings of farmers all over Australia and are now pushing tens and if not hundreds of farmers off their farms in the course of every single week. What about the miners that you mocked when I raised the point about red tape, green tape and black tape? They are all genuinely un very concerned that they won't be able to develop their businesses much more than they have, that they won't be able to initiate new projects when the country desperately needs to boost its export potential. What do you do? Do you tie up all those projects in any area rather than uh, have the courage uh, to take the decisions that are required? Manufacturers, for example, you hit them on one side by cutting protection. You fail to deliver the other side, which is by genuine micro-reform. Genuine reductions in the costs of waterfront and uh, coastal shipping and other shipping, transportation, land transport. You wouldn't have a clue either. You're presiding over a couple of major... The of the House. Anyway, Mr. 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 Speaker, let me, finish my, let me finish my position. The I, of the House. Let me finish my presentation by quoting just one, one view, which maybe the Prime Minister Order, can the understand. The House. Maybe the Prime Minister can understand this letter from Hayden Slater, who says, I am a 13-year-old student at Cummins Area School, and I am witnessing many of our close friends and my family having great financial trouble. My parents are doing their best to educate myself and my brothers, but our income is cut in halves. I have seen my parents work so hard, but are not getting anywhere because we have no money. I hope this crisis will not break up the families. If it does, it will be the fault of politicians that run Australia. It's not fair if we have to suffer and you don't. I hope someone reads this letter. Now you know how I and thousands of other people around Australia feel right now. Please help. You can stand up with your statistics. You can talk your head off. But Hayden Slater Order. and millions of Australians will never understand the, the consequences of your incompetence. Yeah. Is the motion seconded? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, let me uh, say that I, uh, I trust that... Um, order, order, members of the Opposition. I trust that uh, when uh, the Leader of the Opposition replies to Hayden Slater, he will do what he's not yet been prepared to do for the rest of Australia, and that is spell out to Hayden Slater the policies that you would implement to deal with the issues that you're talking about. You have not once, you have not once in this place told this House, let alone Hayden Slater, what this opposition and this opposition leader would do differently from this government other than this, and that is that you say that you would have kept interest rates higher and for longer. And I hope you'll therefore have the honesty to tell Hayden Slater that in those circumstances he would be looking, he would be looking to a situation of deeper and more prolonged recession uh, under the leadership of this country if you are ever in that position. But listen, Mr Speaker, the uh, speech of the Leader of the Opposition was riddled with hypocrisy. Let me start, let me start from the beginning. Let me start from the beginning. The he, said, he, said, Mr. Speaker, he said, Mr Speaker, that I produced a string, that I and the Treasurer had produced a string of boring statistics. And he let us know that he was going to immediately demolish. He was going to immediately demolish this string of boring statistics. 
So, as you can imagine, I sat here in trepidation, waiting for this attack upon my string of boring statistics. What was the attack, Mr Speaker? This was the attack. He said, let's look at inflation. Let's look at inflation. Order. What did he say Order. then? The he, said, he said, look at inflation. Yes, it has come down. But his words were, wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be amazing if inflation didn't fall in a recession? Wouldn't it be appalling? He said, you would expect inflation to fall in a recession. Well, that's a very interesting attack upon my statistic, because I regret very much, Mr Speaker, having to go back in history, because I know he doesn't like it, but perhaps the Leader of the Opposition will recall what, would hap what happened in 1982-83. You had a recession then, the worst since 1930. But what happened to inflation, Mr Speaker? You, of course, would expect inflation to fall in a recession. You just said so. So it must be true. But what happened in your recession? Inflation didn't fall. It went up to 11.2 per cent. I mean, what are you talking about? This so-called professor of economics who says it's absolutely inevitable that in, an in, that in a recession, inflation must fall. Professor, the visiting professor said so. It must be true. Well, visiting professor, look up the statistics of your recession, the one in which you guided the Conservative government, and you were unique, as we've said before. You were absolutely unique. You did what no other government had ever done before. You simultaneously produced double-digit unemployment and double-digit inflation. So where are you, Professor? Why is it true? Why is it true? Why must it inevitably be so that inflation falls in a recession? If it is inevitably true, why didn't it happen in your recession? Or is it just that you are totally incompetent? Or have you a convenient bout of amnesia? The fact is that you won't face up to is why you had simultaneous double-digit unemployment and double-digit inflation was because you had no idea of how to run a wages policy in this country. You walked away from trying to get some acceptable aggregate outcome in wages. And so you had an 18 per cent blowout in wages. And that, Professor Hewson, is why it is not inevitable that in a recession you'll get falling inflation. Because if you are so comprehensively incompetent as you have proved yourself to be when you've had the opportunity of having a hand in running the Australian economy, you and only you in the history of this country will produce at one and the same time double-digit unemployment and double-digit inflation. You were the guiding hand in that and you have the temerity now, eight years later, to stand up and say, please give me back control to do the same things to you again that I did before. You must be a joke. But then, Mr. S Mr Deputy Speaker, he went on from that performance to talk about the question of courage in decision taking. Well, I would just like to quote back to Professor Hewson his own words on this matter of courage, respective political courage between me and my colleagues and the Conservatives. Could I just, could I just uh, share with the House these words, these words of Professor Hewson? The assets test, the assets test. I quote Professor Hewson. I, I, the um, Prime Minister, as he was then, his, uh, as he was then, in his current capacity, leave the Well, he wasn't speaking. He was speaking in his then incapacity. He was then, he was speaking in his then incapacity as Professor Hewson. Now, Mr. Speaker. This is what he said. The 17th of September, not, I know you don't like it, nor should you, because this is what your now leader had to say about courage in the political parties. OK, well, let's see. OK, would you like to hear what he had to say? Yeah, OK. Order, the deputy now, leader. OK, listen to what he had to say. Then for Gilmore. Quote, the assets test on pensions and the lump sum superannuation decisions are fundamentally sound decisions economically. They are the sort of decisions that a Conservative government may want to introduce but may not have the courage to. <laughs> now, how do you like that? There's the analysis by the then 
uh, Professor Hewson, the now Leader of the Opposition, analysing the nature of politics in this country. I repeat, the assets test on pensions and the lump sum superannuation decisions are fundamentally sound decisions economically. They are the sort of decisions that a Conservative government may want to introduce but may not have the courage to. It gets better. In such circumstances, presumably, it is better to let the other guys take the political flack for implementing these decisions. And this man, this man gets up and talks about political courage. He says, name one tough decision you've taken. I'll name tough decisions until he gets sick of hearing them. I'll start with the assets test. A correct decision, but one which your party ran away from, conducted the most vicious campaign around this country. I'll talk about the fringe benefits test. And going from great things like that, I've come to the period now that you've been leader, and we'll find out about the massive reserves of courage with which you've been so uniquely endowed. You came along and on a great big decision, a great big fiscal decision about a charge at the War Memorial, you had a call from Beryl Bow Repair. Beryl Bow Repair decided, in a context where she was totally satisfied with the decision this government had made about the the allocation of revenue, the allocation of money, perfectly satisfied, but she wanted to do some more things at the War Memorial. So she decided that she'd impose a rather modest charge. She spoke to the minister. The minister said, well, yes, uh, yes, that's OK. And uh, she said, well, I'm talking to the opposition. Talk to uh, Dr Hewson. And I raised it with him. And he said, yes, that's all right. And she said, uh, Dame Beryl said, well, should I talk to uh, Senator Newman? No, says this courageous leader. No, says this courageous leader. Leave Jocelyn to me. That'll be all right. Leave Jocelyn to me. Leave Jocelyn to me, indeed. What happened? Captain, Captain Courageous walks into the, uh, into the joint party room and he's not heard. Not a boo from him. He's rolled by Jocelyn Newman. Oh, and he's got the hide to get up here and talk about courage. If you haven't got the courage to stand up to Jocelyn Newman in the joint party room on a small charge for the war memorial, what chance will you have of being any different from the people in the Conservative Party that you so properly analysed? never had the courage to take a tough decision. Let's look at them. And these will be related to the tough decisions that I've taken with my colleagues. What about the question of tariffs? Yeah, you were in office all those period of time, and you kept those high tariff walls, which were the single most damaging and damning thing you could do for the future of this country. And it wasn't until I came along, and I only personalise it because you personalised the censure motion, it wasn't until I came along with my string of able colleagues, and we said, and we said, that's not good enough. And if you think it was easy, if you think it was easy to reduce the tariffs, well, have another think. Because a raid against me and my colleagues, I had the serried ranks there of a whole range of employers, not all of them, because some of them have learned better than you, but we certainly had a whole lot of the trade unions as well. And we had a whole lot of community organisations. Well, I had mayor Coronel. after mayor coming to me and saying, no, no, no. Trade unions, employers, civic leaders, Men the whole Coronel. ranks of them saying, don't do it. But we knew it was the right thing to do. And we had the courage to do it. Now, very interestingly, on this question of leadership, let me quote uh, what the uh, Leader of the Opposition had to say. You'll show what little substance this man has. What a hollow man he is. The 28th of April this year, he was doorstop. You've got to doorstop him. He's not too keen on having full press conferences, I tell you. You've got to be quick to catch him. Order, now, Mr Ballarat. Speaker, in a doorstop, Order, the in, a doorstep, on the, in a doorstop on the 28th of April, the Leader of the Opposition said on the waterfront issue, he said this, what we need is the Prime Minister to show some leadership. The sooner the Prime Minister shows that kind of leadership, he's got to provide some leadership. 
And specifically, he was demanding, Mr. Speaker, that I show some leadership by ensuring genuine enterprise bargaining on the waterfront. Now, Mr. Speaker, normally, as you know, and you know me very well over a long period of time, normally modesty would prevent me taking up that. Uh, uh, very modest, but, but I have to. Uh, I have to, on this occasion, do a little bit of quotation, because, uh, as you know, just a two or three days after that uh, challenge to my leadership to do something about waterfront reform, I spent a few hours on this issue, and uh, then, uh, uh, after it, a journalist asked uh, uh, a person who is not really normally well known as being one of our supporters, asked Captain Setchell, journalist, as a captain, you must be used to giving orders. What was it like to be taking orders from Mr Hawke? And as I say, uh, I'm, I'm reluctant to say this, but Captain Setchell's answer was in these terms. I think he demonstrated to us the leadership qualities that he truly has. I think he was quite remarkable. Well, uh, as, I, as, I, as I say, uh, um, uh, oh. No, no, I can't. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't. No, no, once, once, once is enough. Once is enough. But uh, on the substance, on the substance of it, which is uh, very disturbing as far as the philosophy and the attitude of those opposite are concerned, after asking me to show the leadership to go in, produce something on the waterfront. As usual, as they try to write down not just me and my colleagues, but write down employers, write down trade unions, write down their country, they then wanted to write down what was truly, not just because of me, but because of the cooperation I was able to get from employers and workers, what was a truly great achievement. They wanted to write it down. But uh, what's the analysis that's made by others? I quote from uh, the Australian Business, May the 15th. Says one pro reform waterfront employer, quote, actually, we did quite well relative to uh, the union's original claim. The wages out. Well, see, the employer doesn't know. They know much better than the employer on the waterfront. I, now, I, I see. warned the member for uh, Coronella. Okay, we have the position, Mr. Speaker, where, where, this, where this array of talent knows better, this array of talent knows better than the employers on the waterfront. And this is what they Order. had to Members say. The this is what they had to say. The member Actually, for Aston. we did the quite well relative to their original claim. The wages outcome was lower than the unions wanted, and we got a commitment to finalising the award negotiations and to reclassifications. They then had to say this. Anyone who criticises the deal is either taking a short-term view of it or doesn't understand the complexities of getting the changes we want. In other words, Mr Speaker, what we did there was simply another illustration of what we've done in leadership in government for eight years. When there are tough decisions to be taken, I, as Prime Minister, and this government McEwen. as government, this Treasurer as Treasurer, Order. we Minister take McEwen. those tough decisions. And that is why, Mr Speaker, when the time comes, when the test is to be made in two years' time, you'll finish where you finished before. You said. What have Order. I done in terms of leadership the, the last two years? I tell you what, expired. I've led them to victory twice and I'll lead them again. The question is a motion to be agreed to. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I must say, after that uh, shrill and excitable performance from the Prime Minister, it is no wonder that your own backbench are literally openly in the corridors of this place saying that it's time you win. Yeah. And if ever I saw a performance of a bloke whose career was a swinging carcass, then I've just, just seen it from Bob. I mean, talk about a man under siege, a man under pressure. I mean, you'd never know, I mean, from that pathetic performance, you'd never know that the motion before the House today concerned the rising level of unemployment. He barely addressed the, the basis of the censure motion. Let me read it out to him. This House censures the Prime Minister for his lack of leadership, his failure in economic policy, which has put a million Australians out of work, sent thousands of businesses broke and pushed Australia five years further down the road to, to a banana republic. Look, this is an open and shut case. The fact is, go back five years—and, I mean, wasn't it entertaining? 
the Treasurer. You know, there he was rewriting history about what he said back in 1986. But go back to 1986. The significance of the anniversary of your Republic, uh, Banana Republic statement last uh, five years ago, uh, Treasurer, is simply this. The fact is you have failed your own test. Not a test that we established, not a test established by some uh, economic commentators or by business or by your own party, a test you yourself established. You were the one with the Prime Minister who established the height at which the high jump bar would be set. And the, and the, the five years today marks that failure of your own very own test. And in that whole time, in the last five years, we've had nothing but deception from you people as to the state of the economy. And some of the leadership, one aspect of the leadership that we rightfully look to a Prime Minister to provide is some leadership as to the assessment, a realistic assessment of the Australian economy. I mean, go back to September 87, when this Treasurer said, had the audacity to say, this is the great coming of age of Australia. Every year, a year later, the mini budget uh, in 88, he said, we have acted decisively to turn the situation around. And then remember this one, August 1988, he said, this is the one that brings home the bacon. And last year, he said, uh, you know, when referring to the 1990 budget, he said, uh, these, these, were the definitely, these were definitely the golden years of change. And I went back, actually, to the debate that we had this day 12 months ago to see what the Treasurer was then saying and how revealing it, it is. Year in, year out, he deceives people about the state of the economy. He said, I mean, this is classic Keating Ease. He said, the Honourable Member for Flinders now has the indecency to talk about a slowdown in the economy as though it were a deep recession. <laughs> well, those words come back to haunt you, Treasurer, as well they might. Now, look, Australia is not heading towards a recovery. We are heading towards a depression. We're not a banana republic. This is basically a good country. We've got good people, we've got good natural resources, we've got a stable political system. But the truth is that the economic fabric, the economic structure of this country is literally wasting away in front of our very eyes. I don't, I don't use that word depression lightly, and it is a matter of balance between you know, the importance of telling people the truth about the economy and giving people a realistic assessment of the economy and the danger of a sense of uh, doom and gloom becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. But you just can't avoid a sense of apprehension about what's going on in Australia today. By Labor's own words, the situation is now worse uh, than what it was in 82 and 83. And Bob Carr, the leader of the Labor Party in New South Wales, said that, what, only 10 days ago. The data highlighting an unabated continuation of the recession that has come out in recent days legitimately provides the question as to whether or not Australia is, in fact, heading for a depression. There's no doubt that Australia is in the grips of the worst recession since the horrific experience of the 1930s. And look, no one wants to talk the economy down. But accepting the government's rose-coloured glasses view of the economy doesn't do anybody any good either. The evidence that is emerging across the broad, uh, you know, both statistical and analytical, raises serious concern that the recession Australia is currently experiencing is deep enough for the term depression to be at least introduced into the public debate. And the situation is worsening. If you look at the figures uh, from the BCA over the weekend, I had a bloke bring me up from, up from Sydney this morning, and he said that he'd been in business for 40 years, he employed 40 people, and they're about to all go out of business and to lose their jobs. And I just say, I mean, if the images of thousands of people queuing up for blocks in Melbourne, uh, for, for jobs in Melbourne recently, uh, you know, were uh, months for jobs that were months away, I mean, surely it, it ought to remind members of the government you know, of the desperation of the unemployed in the Great Depression. I mean, surely those images of the, you know, of the moonlight marches to bring to people's attention uh, the plight of the unemployed in the 1930s is, a, is a, an image which we see now outside some shops uh, in the 1990s. And the former finance minister, Senator Peter, Wal Peter Walsh, has already said publicly that it's arguable that Australia is in a depression. 
Labor MPs used the word depression to describe the circumstances in 1982. Now, 1990-91 is worse than 1982, but in 1982, these guys they really know a depression when they see one. And in fact, if you go back to what they said, look at, uh, look at the, the uh, Treasurer's own remarks. It, he said uh, in the parliament, going back, looking at 1982, he said, in 1982, when the honourable gentleman had interest rates at the level they now are, the, econ the economy was in a state of depression. It was at the bottom of its worst depression since the Great Depression. Well, if that was the worst, where are we now, Treasurer? And I asked the, uh, the Prime Minister a very simple question. On the basis of the Treasurer's own definition in 1982, would he countenance the word depression? And he skipped away very quickly. But it wasn't just the Treasurer. It was people like uh, the Minister for Employment, uh, who uh, referred to 1982 as a depression, the former Housing Minister, Mr Herford, the Minister for Finance, uh, Mr Willis, and the former Leader of the Opposition, leading the pack back in those times are all on the public record in Hansard describing the economic downturn of 1982 as a depression. If they believe Australia was experiencing a depression then, then why are they so reluctant to confront the same terminology now? And, and if, if regardless of your view about the general state of the economy, the fact is that some sectors of the Australian economy are in a depression, and it's about time you people faced up to it. And I refer specifically to Victoria, where they've been downgraded again. And I refer specifically to the rural crisis, where hard times for many Australians are unfortunately still ahead of them. Now, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is not just a short-term phenomenon that we face. I mean, it is true that many of our problems are chronic in the sense that we've had them for a long time. I mean, I think of the Commonwealth state relations mess, the financial mess there. I mean, I think it is no wonder that the states have been big spenders and acted irresponsibly in recent years, given the way in which Commonwealth financial relations have become established in recent years. Uh, on, on, tax, on the tax system, you were saying during question time that you would made major reforms to the tax system, but, Treasurer, you are damned out of your own words, because in 1985 you yourself said, you yourself said in 1985, unless we were prepared to introduce a consumption tax, as part of an overall package, then we would only ever be making peripheral changes to the tax system. You were right then. You were right then. You have no answer to uh, the need for, for radical tax reform. Industrial relations. Since 1968, this country has had a poor industrial relations system. Since they let Clary O'Shea out of jail in Melbourne, we've had the rule of the jungle in, rule of the jungle in industrial relations. And waterfront and shipping, in fact, wherever you look in the Australian economy, the truth of the matter is that our problems are, uh, are in fact chronic. And you see, that's the great thing about the 1986 statement. You yourself recognised that our problems were exactly that. Chronic had been with us for a long time and were building up to exacerbate you know, our economic circumstances. And the charge against you and the charge against your leader is that you recognised the problem and then you sat pat and did nothing about it. You blame everybody else, banks, bishops, business people, anybody else. The truth is you can't escape your own mouth. When you said it was a recession that we had to have, when you admitted that it was a recession that you deliberately engineered, I mean, really, no one should have been surprised. Because, you see, if you go back to 1986, you actually predicted that if you were so undisciplined, so disinterested in our salvation, then that would be the inevitable consequence. Your own words, Treasurer. I mean, I, uh, I say to you, I mean, in a sense, the, the Leader of the Opposition was right. In a sense, it was your finest hour. I mean, it was chillingly accurate what you said then. Look what you said. You sent shockwaves literally through the stock market. And, and you used the occasion, rightly, to sort of shock the Australian community into supporting the changes that we would need to make. You said we were too complacent. In that sense, you are right. I say to you that, in a way, I pay you a compliment you know, without reservation. It was a public exhibition of political frankness a display of honesty that we've rarely seen from the government side. But quite frankly, that honesty, that frankness uh, was transitory. It's deserted you, the courage is gone, and what is left now is nothing but blind ambition. Treasurer, five years ago, you honestly set the standard by which the Australian economy should be judged, and you failed. 
You know you've failed and you don't have the courage to face it. I say, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that in the next couple of years, I mean, not only is the Prime Minister the problem, but our problem is that, in one sense, he's the solution for the next two years. And what this country needs is a recognition of our problems and some determination to do something about it. And uh, as the recession delivers the message through rising unemployment uh, of Labor's failures, then increasingly people look for the answers. Well, there are no simple answers, and we make that very clear in our appreciation of today's economic circumstances. But there are things that could be done. I mean, you could start in the next week or so and send a message to investors that you've got some confidence and that they can have some confidence in the future of this country. So you could say yes to Coronation Hill. You could say yes to the Australian tourist industry by supporting that third runway at Sydney Airport that's been waiting for years and years and years, nearly as long as you've been Treasurer. And you could say yes to uranium mining so we could start to do something about exports. But you should and need to go beyond that. We need a national savings policy. Our problem is that we rely on the savings of foreigners. That's our debt, $160-odd billion in gross terms, grown from 90 just five years ago. We need radical changes to the tax system. You ought to abolish the capital gains tax. Why? Because we want to give people some incentive to see if we can drag this country into a recovery. We ought to have a, a change in the tax system because your tax system taxes people who export. You penalise the very people who provide for this country some opportunity to go for better times. You ought to introduce a goods and services tax because there are still a lot of people who cheat the tax system. There are still a lot of people who are PAYE taxpayers who pay more tax. The very people you claim to represent uh, have a millstone around their neck of PAYE tax as a result of your failure to introduce meaningful tax reform. And of course, I mean, you blame everybody. We never hear and blame the ACTU. Why? Because they're your conspirators, your co-conspirators uh, in, uh, in, in Australia's circumstances. On industrial relations, we still have a very inflexible system. We need voluntary employment agreements. Your idea of enterprise bargaining, just mugging enterprises, going around with a shotgun and saying to enterprises, you know, sign on the bottom line in accordance with a deal that Bill and Paul have worked out. Now, that's not genuine. You know it. We ought to have genuine enterprise uh, agreements. We ought to have secret ballots before strikes so that the union members, the rank and file, can have say, some say in their unions. And we ought to abolish compulsory trade unionism and give people some of their rights back. And your waterfront reforms clearly not adequate. Again, I mean, not a test that I've set for you, a test by David White, the minister in Victoria, a Labor minister, who said it was clearly not enough. Or shipping. You ought to do something about the Reserve Bank. We ought to get the politicians out of the printing presses so we can do something about inflation. We ought to have a decent competitive policy in telecommunications, not the two phone policy, not the two telephone policy that you've introduced. The fact is, uh, Mr Deputy, as I conclude, as you look at, as you look at this uh, censure motion, it is an open and shut case. The Prime Minister is deserving of the, of the strongest censure of this motion. You put the test treasurer in five years, he's failed it, you've failed it, and at the next election you deserve the censure which the Australian people will deliver to you. The question is the motion to be agreed to. The Honourable the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker, it is, it is a sad commentary on, on Australian public life that... that no, 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 no. Deputy that, Leader. It's a sad the commentary on Australian the public life that a debate of this nature, which is keyed off statements that I made five years ago and policies which were introduced over the period, which pointed to the need for structural change in Australia, and the difficulties Australia would face without it, that in the opposition believing that such remarks were significant enough to mount a motion in the parliament on the anniversary of them having been said, that the contributions of the Leader of the Opposition and the Deputy Leader of the Opposition were rhetorical, empty, free Members of logic, of free of any acknowledgement of change, free of any qualify, qualified analysis, free of any positive feature which would point to the needs 
the progress having been made and the need for per further progress to be made. If you are an Australian person viewing Ballarat. Parliament and watching this debate, you would take a very jaundiced view of our national prospects. Whereas, in fact, Mr Speaker, in this period it has been a period of vast change in Australia. And while you may say, and while you may say, I know what you're saying, while you may say that we are, as the Deputy Leader said, he said we are now heading towards a depression, although I might say Mr Howard had this to say on that subject today. Member McEwen. Australia, the member for Benelong said, was not heading for a depression, and any comparison with the 1930s was an exaggeration, he said. He said uh, the, the economy was nowhere near as bad as in the 1930s, the spectre of the 1930s, which was not an accurate picture of the economy. He said, I don't want to do that because, in my heart, I don't believe things were as bad as they were in those days. Well, I compliment him on his honesty. He's correct, of course. Of course he's correct. But, of course, we had no such honesty from the Leader of the Opposition, who said it was the worst recession in 60 years, or the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, who said it was a depression. And can I say, can I say, Mr. Can I, can I say, Mr. Speaker, well, I asked the Treasury today. I asked the Treasury yet. today to tell me what the unemployment rate in 1991 would be if the March 1983 participation rate applied, and similarly the unemployment rate in March 1983 if the April participation, April 91 participation rate applied. And the answer is that the unemployment rate today if the March 83 participation rate applied would be 5 per cent, and the unemployment rate in the time of the former government in March 83, if today's participation rate applied, would be 14.7 per cent. And I table the document with the, uh, with the assumptions. Now, now, there it is. This is that the Leader of the Opposition said this is the worst, worst recession in 60 years, but by, the, by any measure, a simple analysis of, of participation rates puts the unemployment rate at 15 per cent in 83 and on the same basis 5 per cent today. Now, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, so I, I, I demolish that point. Then we had the Leader of the Opposition saying he was we were selectively quoting statistics. For the past five years, we have taken no hard decisions, which, of course, any observer of Australian public life would know that was patently untrue. Uh, he went on to say that any fool can create jobs. He had nothing to say of the job creation of the period between 1983 and 1990. Uh, and, uh, and then he said that, uh, and then uh, the, leader, the deputy leader said that uh, we'd failed our own tests. Uh, he said that uh, it's no wonder the states there acted irresponsibly and we had no national savings policy. Now, that was the sum total of their contribution. Whereas the fact of the matter is this, Mr Deputy Speaker. In these years, this is what Australia faces now in the 1990s, as distinct from what it faced at the beginning of the 80s. It has a competitive exchange rate mechanism. It has a, a structural fiscal surplus in the national budget. It has a high profit share brought about by a change in wage levels and prices. It has a rational tax system which supports income producing, earning businesses with cash flows and doesn't tax their dividends twice. It has a huge shift in it to a more educated, to a more educated and trained workforce through high retention rates in school and training. In merchandise exports, a shift in the basic productive capacity of the economy of merchandise exports increasing by 80% between May 86 and March 91, of manufactured exports increasing by 178 per cent between May 86 and March 91, a current account deficit improved by 24 per cent between April 1986 and March 1981, with GDP having risen by 15 per cent over the same period and employment having risen by 11. And we face the 1990s with those things, the competitive exchange rate, the structural budget surplus, the high profit share, the sensible tax system, the shift to an educated workforce, a basic shift to exports and a savings policy underpinning it through occupational superannuation. Now, that occupational superannuation levels will be five times our national debt in the year 2000. Five times our national So, as we face the 1990s, sure. In cyclical terms, we face a recession and we face rising unemployment. But as we face the 1990s, we face 
all those structural things having been changed, a competitive exchange rate, the fiscal surplus, the high profit share, the capacity for higher investment, the further shift of the external sectors away from domestic demand, a more sensible rationing of credit through the banking system, and coming down the back of it, a huge savings pipeline plugged into it through dividend imputation and the equities market. Now that's what we face through that. That's what we face in the night. What did we face in the 1980s? A recession, as the Prime Minister said, with a recession with high inflation. With high inflation. Not a recession with low inflation, a recession with high inflation. With profits smashed to pieces with investment having fallen apart for five or seven years, with no shift of the external sector, with an uncompetitive exchange rate mechanism and no savings policy, and a tax system which favoured speculative investment against income-producing value-added investment. That is the structural change we face. It's almost so that nobody can muck it up. As we get back to better prices, on today's export volumes, on today's export volumes, on today's export volumes and 1989 terms of trade prices, we would have now a stable debt position this very day. Now, if our exports continue to grow as they have right through the 1980s, as they have right through the 1980s, and there's the December quarter balance of payments export line, a continuous line of growth right through the 1980s, right through the 1980s into the 1990s, that as that those volumes continue to grow, and if there is any, even without a lift in prices, Australia will stabilise its debt with a low inflation rate, with a low inflation rate, a lower cost of capital, kicking along investment, and that investment funded by the huge savings pipeline of occupational superannuation. That's what we offer Australia. With a train worth, what have you ever offered? In your barren sterility, what have you ever offered? Oh, look, all you can, all, all that you're about is a few negative. You, you think that negative. Stupid, like, like the remark you made, the last remark you made. Fancy saying, as you said, get the politicians out of the printing presses of the Reserve Bank. <laughs> with, with, the with having administered the toughest monetary policy in the OECD, which you then say, on the one hand, we've had high interest rates and pushed the economy in a recession. On the other hand, you say, we've had the politicians with the printing press. I mean, the fact is, the fact is you're absurd. You're absurd. You're stupid and absurd. And Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if 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 you look at the 1990s now, with with the competitiveness coming off the exchange rate, with in, with in, with inflation, with a low inflation rate, with that structural budget surplus, with those savings coming into to uh, the business community, with the high profit share funding that investment and with a lower cost of capital and even halfway decent terms of trade, it's game, set and match for Australia. Game, set and match for Australia. It is. Now, the member Ben Long hangs his, hangs his head. I mean, I don't mind an irrational... Look, I can cop irrational debate. I can cop it any day of the week. We've just heard two irrational speeches. But when you see those prospects... I mean, frankly, the only difficulty for the government, the only difficulty for the government is being around long enough to see it. That's all. That's all. Not that it won't happen. No, not that it won't happen. No, no. We recognise economic difficulties where the Order, political the difficulties leader. we're in. But being around long enough. Order, but the there the can be no doubt about that Australia Including will be a low inflation, McKeown. productive country not with a see. huge merchandise trade surplus right through the 1990s, as sure as I stand here. And uh, Mr Speaker, that is what the Liberals want to get their hands on. That's why they want to win the next election, because they may say in their more tawdry moments and try and dismiss the changes of the middle 80s and the late 80s, what they want to get their hands on is on that structure. They want to put their name on the maker's label on a structure we created. That's what they're about. And that's why, and that's why you wanted to win the last one and the 87 one. But the fact of the matter is you won't win, you won't win the next one because out there now, you, you, you traffic in the pessimism of, uh, of, uh, that, com that comes from uh, this kind of circumstance. You traffic in it and you rejoice in it. You rejoice in that pessimism. But I'm telling you this, that as it dawns on people, as that inflation rate comes down, as that cost of capital comes down, as the savings build up in superannuation, as that profit share holds, as the investment picks up, 
And as those export volumes continue to grow, as they now do inexorably, month after month, in a structural way, you'll eat your hearts out as that structure comes good for us and for Australia. And as sure as I stand here, it will. Now, the fact is, you may think that the times are made for you, that there is a recession, that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, we're, we're in a position. Well, I don't know whether you notice the, the, the Economist today, and it's got the position in the cycle. And it's, uh, this is the trough of the recession. It's got Australia first in and first out, then Canada, Sweden, Britain, Switzerland, France, Italy, Spain, Holland, Germany, and Japan. We will be first out, and we'll be first out with that structure in place. With that structure in place. As if, you, as if you would ever have the wit to put something of this comprehension and quality together. As if you could ever have the wit. You useless people. You useless people. You sat there for years. You had, you had profits falling to pieces. You had wages all over the place. You had inflation up. You had a recession at the same time. You had merchandise exports dying. You had imports surging. You created by in the first two this government wasn't in office two years and you took our debt to 32 per cent of GDP through your ineptitude. And there you are, you sit back, there's not a solid idea amongst any of you on the front bench and you're sitting praying, waiting like a, like a praying mantis to spring the electoral trap and to pick up the structure the government's painstakingly put into office. Well, don't think that our political embarrassment with the recession or the difficulties which the Australian people unhappily face are such that that will camouflage basically a long-term structure for their prosperity into the 1990s, because it won't, and that will be apparent to you. And you think, if only we could be lucky to inherit right their creativity. If only we could be lucky enough to inherit their creativity. Well, you won't be. You won't be. We'll fight like hell to deny it to you, to deny it, to claim what's ours. That is the new economic society of this country created by us. Created by us, created Order. by us. Yes, members well, of the opposition. We've got yes, we've got, but we've kept 1.5 million of those jobs. Sure, we've got those uh, the higher unemployment, but they will come down because of those high Bell, participation right. rates. And as as they've gone up, they will come down. And we won't have to fill two jobs for every job like we did with the long-term unemployment you left us in the 1980s, because this time the participation rate is at such a level that as the jobs are created, they'll come straight off the unemployment lists. And that's what you fear, and well you might. So the fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, let me conclude on this point, that one would have thought at this moment, when there is a chance, a chance to stand back for five years and say, well, what has happened? There would have been some acknowledgement of the structural change, some positive elements from the opposition about Australia's portents, but rather what they do, they made cheap, miserable, hollow political speeches. And you can only say, if you, if you were an outsider looking at the opposition, you'd say, God help Australia. God help us with these sort of people. Well, on this side of the thing, we're not a, we're not, we're, we can all do with God's help, but over here we help ourselves as we're helping the nation. And, uh, and uh, the fact is, Mr Speaker, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be helping Australia to a more prosperous society into the 1990s on the back of those structural chains. And in saying that, I say we reject absolutely the uh, motion of censure against the Prime Minister in the terms it's written, and I move that the question be now put. The question is the motion be agreed to. Um, is, is leave granted for the document to be tabled? Leave's granted. Uh, the question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is the question be now put. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I point the honourable members for Canning and Fowler, tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Riverina, Darling and Wakefield, tell us for the nose. Thank you. 
You got the score, George? Order. The result of the division is ayes 71, noes 66. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion of censure be agreed to. Those of that opinion please say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I point the honourable members for Wakefield and Riverine and Darling tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Canning and Fowler tell us for the noes. Order. The result of the division is ayes 66, noes 71. The question is therefore resolved in the negative. Presentation of papers. Uh, I'll um, ask members to resume their seats and we'll move on to the question of presentation of papers. Uh, ministerial statements. Any ministerial statements? Yeah. 
And Mr Speaker has received a letter from the Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition proposing a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the Prime Minister's failure to implement economic policies to arrest Australia's slide into banana republic status. I call upon those members who approve the proposed discussion to rise in their places. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Leave the, house. the question oh, is business the day be called on. Those of that opinion, please say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is the motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I point the honourable members for Canning and Fowler tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Wakefield and Riverina Darling tell us for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is eyes 70, nose 64. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. <laughs> Mr Speaker has received a message from the Senate transmitting the following resolution agreed to by the Senate.